Ahead on C-SPAN 2, a House subcommittee looks at how the nation's computers can be protected from viruses and worms. Later, members of the House Immigration Reform Caucus and a group of family members of September 11th victims discuss U.S. immigration policy. Quorum being present, the Subcommittee of the Technology, Information Policy, Intergovernmental Relations and the Census will come to order. Good morning. Today we, will, we continue our in-depth review of cybersecurity issues affecting our nation. There are several things unique to cyber attacks that make the task of preventing them difficult. Cyber attacks can occur from anywhere around the globe, from the caves of Afghanistan to the battlefields of Iraq, from the most remote regions of the world or right here in our own backyard. The technology used for cyber attacks is readily available and changes continually. And perhaps most dangerous of all is the failure of many people, including those who are critical to securing these networks and information from attack, to take the threat seriously, to receive adequate training and to take proactive steps needed to secure their networks. A severe cyber attack could have devastating repercussions throughout the nation, both in, physical, in the physical sense and in real economic dollars. The initial plan for this hearing was to focus primarily on strategies and methodologies within the agencies of the federal government for identifying and mitigating computer, computer vulnerabilities through a system of patch management. Recent events, however, have caused us to expand the boundaries of this hearing to include computer systems throughout the nation. This summer, everyone, once again, realized how vulnerable our computer networks are to cyber attack. The blaster worm and so big F virus brought home the reality that unsecured computer systems are all too prevalent and that as a nation, across all levels, government, business, and home users, we must take computer security more seriously than we have in the past. The blaster worm infected over 400,000 computers in under five days. In fact, about one in three Internet users are infected with some type of virus or worm every year. The speed at which worms and viruses can spread is, ast is astonishing, and a contributing factor to that rapid spread is the lethargic pace at which people deploy the patches that can prevent infection in the first place. Microsoft announced the vulnerability and had the patch available weeks before the exploit appeared. The recent viruses and worms have been blamed for bringing down train signaling stations throughout the east, affecting the entire CSX railroad system, which covers 23 states. Additionally, new information is coming to light that the blaster worm is being linked to the severity of the power blackout of last month. The North American Electric Reliability Council blames another worm, Slammer, for impairing bulk electric system control by bringing down networks. We learned last week that the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission issued a formal information notice to nuclear power plant operators warning them about an incident in January in which the slammer computer worm penetrated networks in Ohio's Davis-Bessey nuclear plant and disabled two important monitoring systems for hours. A recent Gartner study predicts that by the year 2005, 90 percent of cyber attacks will attempt to exploit vulnerabilities for which a patch is already available or a solution known. So why aren't systems patched and why aren't antivirus programs kept up to date? This hearing will examine the issues surrounding these incidents, including how vulnerabilities are discovered, how the public is notified about potential vulnerabilities, the mechanisms for protection, the real and potential problems presented by patch systems, and the scope of the problem confronting the federal government, the business community, and the general public. System administrators are often overwhelmed with simply maintaining all the systems they have responsible for overseeing. Challenges that organizations face in maintaining their systems are significant. With an estimated 4,000 vulnerabilities being discovered every year, it is an enormous challenge for any but the best resourced organizations to install all of the software patches that are released by the manufacturer. Not only is the sheer quantity of patches overwhelming for administrators and everyone else to keep up with, but patches can be difficult to apply and have unexpected side effects on other systems that administrators must then evaluate and address. 
As a result, after a patch is released, administrators often take a long time to fix all of their vulnerable computer systems. Obviously, small organizations and home users who lack the skills of system administrators are even less likely to keep up with the flow of patches. The Department of Homeland Security's Federal Computer Incident Response Center recently awarded a $10.8 million five-year contract for government-wide patch management service to notify agencies about security holes in commercial software for systems on their networks and the availability of patches to fix them. The service is known as the Patch Authentication and Dissemination Capability, or PADC. The goal is to simplify patch management by providing administrators only with information relevant to their systems and ensuring that patches are genuine and effective. PADC went online in January of this year. According to officials, once agency system administrators have provided a profile of their systems and software, PADC will alert them to potential vulnerabilities, provide interim security advice until a patch is available, disseminate available patches, and keep management informed of available patches and which ones their systems have down their systems administrators have downloaded. Large organizations such as business and educational institutions often rely on commercial firms to notify them of vulnerabilities. For example, there are several firms that offer vulnerability notification combined with analysis of the customer's computer system for those vulnerabilities. These firms also provide information on where to get the patches and prioritize them for administrators. In addition, the commercial critical infrastructure sectors depend on information from their Information Sharing and Analysis Centers, or ISACs, to help them respond to potential cyber threats. These ISACs are designed to allow members of a sector to share information about incidents to help increase preparedness and vigilance. The progress of BLASTER demonstrates the importance of the early warning systems that ISACs are tasked with developing. Independent researchers discover most vulnerabilities. These researchers may be academics, consultants, or black hats. The Organization for Internet Security is working with software vendors, consultants, and other interested parties to formalize procedures for dealing with vulnerabilities, including vendor notification and controlled disclosures. There's a very important role for government to play in these disclosure procedures. It is no longer acceptable for vendors to determine on their own schedule who gets notified and when. Given the potential national security risk that could emanate from the exploitation of a vulnerability, it is imperative that the appropriate government entities be involved in this process from the beginning. Vulnerabilities in software and the worms and viruses that exploit them have become a fact of life for the Internet. The government, law enforcement, and private industry must develop and continue to update a plan to deal with these emerging threats. How can we educate home and small business users to minimize the risk posed by zombie computers? How can researchers, the government, and the software industry work together to identify and remedy vulnerabilities in the most constructive manner? And how will the federal government evolve an effective patch management program? What can be done to expedite the discovery and prosecution of cyber criminals who release worms and viruses? And most important of all, how can the federal government, law enforcement, and industry work together to protect the vital infrastructure of the, in, of the Internet? We have an outstanding lineup of witnesses this morning who will share with us their expertise as we explore worms and viruses and how we can better protect the nation's computers. As is the custom with this committee, we will ask our witnesses, uh, as they are seated in panel one, to rise and be sworn in. Please rise and raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you God. Note for the record that all of the witnesses responded in the affirmative. We will uh, begin with our first witness. And we, we have a long, we have three panels. The panels are rather large panels. They're unusually large for this subcommittee, uh, but the scope of, of our topic uh, demanded it. But we would ask that all of our witnesses uh, uh, adhere as best they can to our five minute rule. And I'll introduce Mr. Dacey. Robert Dacey is currently Director of Information Security Issues at the U.S. General Accounting Office. His responsibilities included evaluating information systems security in federal agencies and corporations, including the development of related methodologies, assessing the federal infrastructure for managing information security, evaluating the federal government's efforts to protect our nation's private 
and public critical infrastructure from cyber threats and identifying best security practices at leading organizations and promoting their adoption by federal agencies. In addition to his many years of information security auditing, Mr. Dacey has also led GAO's annual audits of the consolidated financial statements of the U.S. government, GAO's financial audit quality assurance efforts, including methodology and training and other GAO financial statement audit efforts. We appreciate your being a part of this uh, panel and uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to be here today to participate in the subcommittee's hearing on cyber incidents and the role of software patch management in mitigating the risks that these types of events will recur. As you requested, I will briefly summarize my written statement. The exploitation of software vulnerabilities by hackers and others can result in significant damage to both federal and private sector computer systems, ranging from website defacements to gaining the ability to read, modify, or delete sensitive information, destroy systems, disrupt operations, or launch attacks against other organizations. The number of reported security vulnerabilities in software products has grown dramatically in recent years to over 11,000 cumulatively reported by CERT-CC since 1995. Factors increasing the risk of system vulnerabilities and exploits include the increasing complexity and size of software programs, the increasing sophistication and availability of hacking tools, increasing system interconnectivity, combined with decreasing length of time from the announcement of a vulnerability until it is exploited, and decreasing length of time for attacks to infiltrate the Internet. Although generally available before vulnerability exploits are launched, Patches are too frequently not installed, resulting in damages to unpatched systems. My written testimony refers to several of these exploits and summarizes the responses to two recently reported serious vulnerabilities. Given these increasing risks, effective patch management programs have become critical to securing both federal and private sector systems. Key elements of a patch management program include top management support, standardized policies, procedures, and tools, dedicated resources and clearly assigned responsibilities, current technology inventories, identification of relevant vulnerabilities and patches, patch risk assessment and testing, patch distribution, and monitoring systems through network and host vulnerability scanning. There are several efforts to address software vulnerabilities in federal systems, including OMB reporting requirements concerning agency patch management programs as part of the Federal Information Security Management Act, or FISMA, NIST patch management guidance, and FedCERC incident reporting, handling, and prevention services. For example, as you mentioned in your statement, FedCERC provides PADC, a patch notification services, which provides agencies at no charge with information on trusted authenticated patches for their specific technologies. PADC currently has 41 agency subscribers although OMB recently reported that actual usages of those, of those accounts are extremely low. A number of commercial tools and resources are available that can assist in performing patch management functions more efficiently and effectively, such as identifying relevant patches, deploying patches, scanning system for vulnerabilities, and providing management reporting. In addition to implementing effective patch management processes, several other steps can be taken to address software vulnerabilities. These include, one, deploying other technologies such as antivirus software, firewalls, and other network security and configuration tools to provide a layered defense against attacks. Two, employing more rigorous software engineering practices in designing, implementing, and testing software products to reduce the number of potential vulnerabilities. Three, improving tools to more efficiently and effectively manage patching. Four, researching and developing technologies to prevent, detect, and recover from attacks as well as identify perpetrators. And five, ensuring effective tested contingency planning processes and procedures. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I would be pleased to answer any questions that you have at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Dacey. I appreciate you adhering to our five-minute rule as well. Our next witness is Richard Pethia. Mr. Pethia directs the CERT Coordination Center, which conducts security incident response activities and fosters the development of incident response infrastructures that leads to rapid correction of vulnerabilities and resolution of incidents. Working out of the Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon University, 
He's been tracking vulnerabilities for 15 years. Before coming to SEI, Mr. Pethia was the Director of Engineering at the Decision Data Company. He has over 30 years' experience in both technical and managerial positions. You're recognized uh, for five minutes, Mr. Pethia. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you especially for the opportunity to testify on the issue of defending against cyber viruses and worms. Um, at the CERT Coordination Center since 1988, we've handled over 260,000 security incidents and have helped to resolve over 11,000 vulnerabilities, published hundreds of security alerts and security best practice guides, and provide training in a variety of security topics. Worms and viruses are, are both a more, in a more general category of programs called malicious code. Both exploit weaknesses in computer software replicating themselves and are attaching themselves to other programs. They spread quickly. By definition, worms are programs that spread without human intervention once they've been introduced into the system, and viruses are programs that require some action on the part of the user, such as opening an email attachment. Today, uh, these worms and viruses are causing damage more quickly than those created in the past and are spreading to the most vulnerable of all, of all systems, computer systems of home users. The code red worm spread around the world faster in 2001 than the Melissa virus did in 1999. Just months later, the NIMDA worm caused serious damage within an hour of the first report of infection, and in January of this year, Slammer had significant impact in just minutes. Virus and worm attacks alone have resulted in millions of dollars of loss in, loss in just the last 12 months. The 2003 Computer Crime Survey states that viruses are the most cited form of attack with an estimated cost of over $27 million across the approximately 500 respondents to the survey. Estimates on the blaster worm and the so big F virus range from $525 million to more than $1 million in loss. The cost estimates include lost productivity, wasted hours, lost sales, and extra bandwidth costs. For the past 15 years, we have relied heavily on fast reaction to ensure that damage is minimized. But today it is clear that reactive solutions alone are no longer adequate. Many attacks are now fully automated and spread with blinding speed. The attack technology has become increasingly complex, increasing the time it takes to analyze the attack and produce countermeasures. We have become increasingly dependent on the Internet. Even short interruptions in service cause significant loss and can jeopardize critical services. Aggressive, coordinated, continually improving response will continue to be necessary, but we all must also move quickly to put other solutions in place. System operators must adopt security practices such as information security risk assessments, security management policies, and secure system administration practices. Senior managers must provide visible endorsement and financial support for these security improvement efforts. They must also keep their skills and knowledge current and educate their users to raise awareness of security issues and improve their ability to recognize and respond to problems. Technology vendors must also take steps, such as producing virus-resistant or virus-proof software, dramatically reducing the number of implementation errors in their products that lead to vulnerabilities, and providing secure out-of-the-box configurations that have security options turned on rather than the required users to, to enable the functions. The government can also help by taking a multi-pronged approach, using its buying power to demand higher quality software, holding vendors more accountable for defects in release products, and providing incentives for low defect products and for products that are highly resistant to viruses. Information assurance research is also needed to yield networks capable of surviving attacks while preserving sensitive information. Among the activities should be the creation of a unified and integrated framework for all information assurance, rigorous methods to assess and manage risk, quantitative techniques to determine the cost benefit of risk mitigation strategies, systematic tools and simulation tools to analyze cascade effects of attacks, and new technologies for resisting, recognizing, and re recovering from attacks, accidents, and failures. More technical specialists should be trained through expanded scholarship programs to build the university infrastructure we will need for the long-term development of trained security professionals. And to encourage safe computing, the government should also support the development of educational material and programs about cyberspace for all users, including home users and small businesses support programs that provide early training in security practices and appropriate use. In conclusion, our dependence on interconnected computing systems is rapidly increasing, and even short-term disruptions from viruses and worms have major consequences. 
Our current solutions are not keeping pace with the increased strength and speed of attack, and our information infrastructures are at risk. The National Cybersecurity Division, formed by the Department of Homeland Security, is a critical step toward implementation of some of these recommendations. However, implementing a safer cyberspace will require the NCSD and the entire federal government to work with state and local governments, the private sector, to drive better software practices, more secure products, higher awareness at all levels, increased research and development activities, and increased training for special computer users and all, and all users. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next witness is Mr. Hale. Lawrence Hale is the director of the Department of Homeland Security Federal Computer, Federal Computer Incident Response Center, or FEDCIRC. He has been active in the information assurance community since 1996 when he, served, when he served the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff as an information assurance action officer working on security interoperability issues. While at the Pentagon, Mr. Hale was a member of the Joint Staff Information Operations Response Cell during a number of exercises and, and actual cyber events which have helped to shape U.S. government policy in dealing with computer security. In January of 1999, Mr. Hale became the first uniformed military officer assigned to the National Infrastructure Protection Center at the FBI headquarters. While there, he worked to improve the process of issuing warnings of cyber-related events and served on the Y2K task force for the FBI. He retired from the United States Navy as a commander in May of 2001 has a master's degree in national security and strategic studies from the Naval War College and a master's in aeronautical science from Embry-Riddle. Welcome to the subcommittee. You're recognized. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Clay. On behalf of the Federal Computer Incident Response Center of the Department of Homeland Security, thank you for this opportunity to appear before you to discuss how we can protect the nation's computers. I'm Lawrence Hale, director of the FedCERC, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security's Information Analysis and Infrastructure Protection Directorate. FedCERC is the federal civilian government's trusted focal point for computer security incident reporting, providing assistance with incident prevention and response. Within the Department of Homeland Security, Information Analysis and Infrastructure Protection is the newly established National Cybersecurity Division. The National Cybersecurity Division is responsible for coordinating the implementation of the national strategy to secure cyberspace. Key functional areas within the division include risk, threat, and vulnerability identification and reduction, cybersecurity tracking, analysis, and response center, and outreach awareness and training. The FedCERC is now a component of cybersecurity tracking, analysis, and response center. The National Cybersecurity Division has combined the information gathering and analytical capabilities of the cyber watch elements of the National Infrastructure Protection Center and the FedCERC and coordinates with the National Communications System. By doing this, the National Cybersecurity Division ha not only has the added benefit of enhanced resources, but the synergy of knowledge created from the unique resources from each of these watch elements. The federal government's ability to limit the effects of the recent wave of worms and viruses on its networks demonstrates how these collaborative relationships work and how each participant's contributions help to assess and mitigate potential damage. FedCERC has the goal of securing the federal government's cyberspace. FedCERC, as noted in the E-Government Act of 2002, the Federal Information Security Management Act, FISMA, uh, serves as the Federal Information Security Incident Center for the federal civilian government. FedCERC is the central government non-law enforcement focal point for coordination of response to attacks, promoting incident reporting and cross-agency sharing of data about common vulnerabilities. As such, FedCERC must compile and analyze information about incidents that threaten information security and inform federal agencies about current and potential information security threats and vulnerabilities. FedCERC demonstrated the National Cybersecurity Division's enhanced coordination role during the recent wave of worms and viruses. Working closely with the CERT Coordination Center and software providers, FedCERC identified the potential impact of newly disclosed vulnerabilities and developed corrective actions and mitigating strategies. Federal civilian agencies were advised of the existence of these vulnerabilities and given actionable information on reducing their exposure to the threats before attack programs were released. Patches were developed, validated, and disseminated to agencies. And working closely with OMB and the Federal CIO Council, agencies were instructed to take action to address the vulnerabilities and report their status. As a result of these measures, the federal government was better prepared to avoid damaging impact when the exploit codes were released and the attack phase of these events occurred. The National Cybersecurity Division has a number of in initiatives underway to aid in threat and vulnerability reduction. 
As was mentioned, the majority of successful attacks on computing systems result from hackers exploiting the most widely known vulnerabilities in commercial software products. The problem is not th that patches to fix these vulnerabilities don't exist, but that existing patches are not quickly and correctly applied. Agencies must have a plan on how patch management is integrated into their configuration management process. FedCERC's patch authentication and dissemination capability, PADC, a web-enabled service that provides a trusted source of validated patches and notifications on new threat and vulnerabilities, is a first step. FedCERC's vision is to build from the ability of providing validated patches to developing a more enhanced IT configuration and vulnerability management program that will automate the process. By automating the process, agencies will no longer have the burden of having to manually apply patches, which will enable them more time to focus on building a more robust configuration management program. In closing, I would like to assure the committee that the National Cybersecurity Division is committed to building on the success that FedCERC has achieved in helping federal civilian agencies protect their information systems from the most damaging effects of malicious code. National Cybersecurity Division must now translate this success to a national scale. I look forward to continuing to work with OMB and the Congress to ensure that we are successful in this important endeavor. Thank you very much, Mr. Hale. I'd like to welcome our distinguished ranking member and vice chair of the subcommittee as well, and we will be taking their opening statements at the conclusion of the first panel's uh, remarks as well. Our next witness is Norman Lorentz. Mr. Lorentz joined the Office of Management and Budget in January of 2002 as Chief Technology Officer, the Chief E-Government Architect for the U.S. Federal Government. Mr. Lorentz is responsible for identifying and developing support for investments in emerging technology opportunities that will improve the government's technical information and business architectures. Prior to joining the federal government, he was Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for the IT Career Solutions Provider, DICE, Inc. In this capacity, he directed the development of technology strategy and infrastructure. He was also the firm's Chief Quality Officer and a member of the Executive Committee. He brings to OMB extensive experience in government. Uh, from, from 1998 to 2000, he was Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for the United States Postal Service. In 1998, he received the Board of Governors Award, the U.S. Postal Service's highest recognition, and this year was named as a Federal 100 winner, as well as recognition by InfoWorld Magazine as one of the 25 most influential CTOs in the United States. And this is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, your last appearance uh, before a Congressional Committee as a public servant with OMB as uh, you will be leaving that agency and moving back into the private sector. So we appreciate your service to, uh, to the government and to this subcommittee, and you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to, uh, to discuss this important topic of worm and virus defense. My testimony today will address how the federal government protects its IT systems from this pervasive threat. By design, worms and viruses can cause substantial damage and prove disruptive to normal business operations. For this reason, it is important for the federal agencies to continuously and rapidly take proactive measures to lessen the number of successful attacks. The month of August proved to be an unusually bu busy uh, time for malicious code activity, beginning with Blaster and then quickly spreading the so big F worm. In general, the federal government withstood these attacks and the impact on ser citizen services was minimal. Agencies have improved their protection against malicious code by installing patches, blocking executables at the firewall, and using antivirus software with automatic updates. Agencies did, however, report modest impacts associated with both worms. To date, reports from federal civilian agencies show approximately 1,000 computers affected by each exploit. This impact ranged from a slowdown in agency email to temporary unavailability of agency systems. A number of laptops proved to be susceptible to the infection since configuration management was uneven on these portable devices. The federal government's ability to thwart worms and viruses depends on a number of interlocking management, technical, and operational controls. It is critical that these controls continue to evolve to keep pace with this increasingly sophisticated threat. First, how are vulnerabilities discovered? DHS, Federal Computer Incident Response Center, FedCERT, closely coordinates with a number of industry as well as government partners. These partners include Carnegie Mellon CERT, law enforcement and intelligence community. These organizations routinely communicate advance notice to DHS regarding the discovery of software vulnerabilities and the development of malicious code. 
Second, the agent, how are agencies notified about these vulnerabilities? OMB and the CIO Council have developed and deployed a process to rapidly identify and respond to cyber threats and critical vulnerabilities. CIOs are advised via conference call as well as follow-up email of specific actions necessary to protect agency systems. Agencies must then report through FedCERC to OMB on the implementation of those required countermeasures. This emergency notification and reporting process was instituted for the Microsoft RPC vulnerability in July, and as a result, the agencies were able to rapidly close vulnerabilities that otherwise might have exploited by the blaster worm. There are mechanisms that exist for protecting systems. The National Institute of Standard and Tech NIST recommends that the agencies implement a patch management program, harden all hosts appropriately, deploy antivirus software, and detect and block malicious code and configure the network perimeter to deny all traffic that is not necessary. As part of this statutory responsibility under FISMA, the National Institute of Standards and Technology will publish in September draft guidelines for incident handling. The guidelines will discuss how to establish and maintain an effective incident reporting and response program with an em emphasis on incident detection, analysis, prioritization and containment. The guidelines will include recommendations for handling certain types of incidents and a distribution of denial of service attacks and malicious code infections. Lastly is the problems presented by the patching systems. Patch management is an essential part of any agency's information security program and requires a significant investment in time and effort. Agencies must carefully follow predefined processes in order to successfully remediate system vulnerabilities across the enterprise. A number of agencies use, utilize automated tools to push the patches to the desktop. The automation of the patch management process is significantly easier when the agency maintains a standardized software configuration. At the present, 47 agencies subscribe to FedCERC's PADC capability. This service validates and quickly distributes the per corrective patches for known vulnerabilities. In closing, OMB is committed to a federal government with resilient information systems. Worms and viruses must not be able or allowed to significantly affect agency business processes. OMB will continue to work with the agencies, Congress, and GAO to ensure that appropriate countermeasures are in place to reduce the impact of malicious code. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our next witness is John Malcolm. Mr. Malcolm is currently a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Criminal Division at the Department of Justice, where his duties include overseeing the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section, the Child Exploitation and Obscenity Section, the Domestic Security Section, and the Office of Special Investigations. It's a pretty robust portfolio. An, an honors graduate of Columbia College and Harvard Law School, Mr. Malcolm served as a law clerk to judges on both the United States District Court for the Northern District of Georgia and the Eleventh Circuit Court of Appeals. For seven years, Mr. Malcolm was an assistant United States attorney in Atlanta, Georgia, where he was assigned to the Fraud and Public Corruption Section. Mr. Malcolm also served as an associate independent counsel in Washington, D.C., investigating fraud and abuse at HUD. Prior to rejoining the Department of Justice in August of 2001, Mr. Malcolm was a partner at the Atlanta law firm of Malcolm and Schroeder, LLP. Thank you for uh, sharing your time with us, and we look forward to your testimony. You're recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify about the Department of Justice's ongoing efforts to protect our nation's critical infrastructure from the growing problem of Internet-borne worms and viruses. Although computer viruses have been around for a long time, the ubiquity of Internet access and household ownership of computers in the United States have manifestly increased the deleterious impact of viruses and worms on our critical infrastructure and on our daily lives. It seems that nearly every week we learn the name of a new computer virus or worm that exploits flaws in commonly used software and quickly spreads through the Internet. Some of these, like the blaster worm, make the front pages of newspapers. These viruses and worms are merely the tip of the iceberg. They're just the ones that receive the most public attention. Hundreds more are released every year, posing a daily challenge to those who are responsible for protecting networks and investigating network attacks. 
The effect of these viruses and worms should not be underestimated. For example, in the United States, the slammer worm shut down the automatic teller machine system and caused significant transportation delays when electronic ticketing used for airline travel was affected. The Love San or blaster worm and its variants have affected hundreds of thousands of computers. Moreover, since the internet is seamless and borderless, the harmful impact of worms and viruses is not limited to our country, but affects countries across the world. Clones or new variants of malicious code continue to crop up, raising concerns that more damaging variants are right around the corner. In many cases, succeeding generations of viruses and worms will build on its capabilities, adding additional harmful payloads. The worldwide damage to computers and data, as well as the productive time lost as a result of worms and viruses is measured in the millions and by some estimates in the billions of dollars. This damage has an undeniable adverse effect on important sectors of our economy and potentially undercuts the security of our nation's critical infrastructure. The Department of Justice has devoted significant resources to investigating and prosecuting persons who release malicious code on the internet. These efforts have met with some success. It bears mentioning, however, that tracking the sources of viruses on worms on the internet is difficult and presents unique challenges to investigators because of the speed with which such programs are spread and fundamental characteristics of computer networks. Particularly in peer-to-peer -peer network applications, it's difficult to determine precisely where an outbreak begins since simultaneous file transfers can occur in co computers literally throughout the world. Although tracking the sources of computer worms and viruses is difficult, the Department of Justice is fully committed to effectively investigating such attacks. The Criminal Division's Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section helps coordinate investigations into computer crimes of all sorts, including virus and worm attacks. These prosecutors, in turn, train and work with computer hacking and intellectual property units and computer and telecommunications coordinators in each of the 93 U.S. Attorney's offices across the country. Together, this network of prosecutors working with law enforcement agents from the Secret Service and the FBI and using important tools that were provided by the Patriot Act provide an integrated approach to addressing computer crime. Because the perpetrators of offenses may live in other countries, the investigations frequently involve an international component that draws upon the Department's contacts with law enforcement counterparts abroad. Indeed, international cooperation is a foundation of the Department's strategy for combating cyber crimes including worms and viruses. Our efforts are rewarded whenever evidence is obtained from foreign countries that further domestic investigations or when we are able to furnish similar assistance to other countries. In addition to international outreach, department attorneys and agencies regularly meet with industry, trade groups, and state and local law enforcement officials in order to improve communication. The Department of Justice pursues a message of a culture of security where both individual users and corporations view computer security as a key component for successful computing experience. Experience sadly teaches us that much of the damage to our computer networks is caused by teenagers and young adults armed with free hacker tools, plenty of time, and too little moral teaching about how to use computers and how not to use computers. Therefore, the department has also pursued educational programs directed to youth their teachers and parents. We describe the program as cyber ethics. In fact, CSIPS, in an article authored by the, the section chief, Marty Stancil Gam, has published a, uh, an article dealing with cyber ethics in the current issue of Newsweek. The Department of Justice continues to make progress in its battle against computer crime and intellectual property theft. Recognizing the challenges ahead, we look forward to continued success in our efforts. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my prepared statement. I look forward to getting your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Malcolm, and thank all of you for your adherence to our time restrictions. Uh, at this time, I'll introduce the ranking member of the subcommittee, the distinguished gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, especially for calling this hearing, and uh, my thanks to the witnesses who have taken this time to be with us today and share their expertise. Uh, com computer bugs like worms and viruses are one more example of the complexity of the world of the world we live in. And the other on the other hand, they are one more example of the frailty of human beings and the difficulty of legislating appropriate behavior. Uh, many worms and, vi and viruses we have seen are nothing more than the exuberance 
of youth experimenting with newly found freedoms and skill. As has always been the case, the pranks of youth can have consequences well beyond their, their capability to understand those consequences. Uh, last week, the FBI arrested a Minnesota high school senior and charged him with intentionally causing and attempting to cause damage to computers protected under federal law. He faces a $250,000 fine and 10 years in prison. Uh, this young man was so naive that he built into his computer bug a direct link to his own computer. Catching him was not difficult. However, the damage done was real. The worm attack he participated uh, in forced shutdowns of computer systems at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, the Maryland Motor Vehicle Administration, the Minnesota Department of Transportation, and part of 3M facilities, including a plant in Hutchinson. Unfortunately, most hackers are neither as naive as this Minnesota teen teenager nor as benign. One of the, the earliest publicly documented cases of hacking was in 1988 at the Lawrence Berkeley lab. Cliff Stoll, an astronomer turned systems manager at Lawrence Berkeley lab, was alerted to the presence of an unauthorized user in, the, in his system by a 75 cents accounting error. His investigations eventually uncovered a spy ring that was breaking into government computers, stealing sensitive uh, military information. Uh, we are faced with de developing public policy that recognizes both the exuberance of youth and the real threat to our government and corporations by those who seek to do us harm. Uh, one element of that public policy must be a renewed attention to preventing these attacks. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I will not go through this entire st uh, statement, uh, but I think that uh, uh, you have indicated um, that you're working on legislation that would encourage corporate America to do a better job of securing their computers, and I look forward to working with you on that legislation. Uh, the problems faced by corporations are much like those facing the federal government. Uh, and we should work together to solve those problems. And I'll submit the entirety of my statement in the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clay. And certainly without objection, your entire statement will be included in the record. And at this time, I would recognize the distinguished vice chair of the subcommittee, the former secretary of state of the great state of Michigan, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, apologizing for being a little late this morning. I had an opportunity to speak on the floor this morning about the second anniversary of the horrific attacks uh, on our nation of 9-11. I certainly appreciate you holding the hearing today. And with the recent computer virus attacks on our nation's information infrastructure, the importance of this hearing is undeniable. Its timing is certainly appropriate. And with the three panels uh, testifying today, I'll be very brief in my opening statement. The focus of today's hearing is to examine what steps are being taken to protect the information infrastructure at both the public and the private levels from the spread of viruses. And we in the federal government certainly have the responsibility of protecting our citizens and ensuring that the infrastructure individuals and businesses rely on is secure. In addition, the government must protect its own systems in order to function efficiently and effectively. And this dual responsibility makes a task facing the federal government particularly challenging. In April of this year, testimony was submitted by Robert Dacey of the uh, GAO to this subcommittee, citing a November 2002 cyber attack that affected both private and government networks and caused $900,000 in damage uh, to computers. This is obviously a significant figure. And if a large-scale cyber attack were implemented, not only would it damage uh, would the damage caused to computers be considerable, but the additional financial losses and damage to the physical infrastructure could seriously affect the operations of our nation. And actually, we in the House of Representatives have uh, firsthand knowledge of how potentially devastating these viruses can be. The recent blaster and the so big virus attacks of just a few weeks ago nearly crippled the House email network by overloading service with a complex array of erroneous messages. Fortunately, the combined efforts of the House Information Resources and the systems administrators in the members' offices limited the extent of damage uh, that the virus creators had likely hoped for. In fact, these attacks likely inhibited our nation's ability to adequately respond to the vast power outage experienced by the eastern half of our nation. 
I certainly shudder at the thought of what could happen to everyday businesses if a successful virus or worm crippled our nation's power grids or financial networks, the Internet, government networks, or any other infrastructure that we rely so heavily on. Viruses are a new weapon of attack for those who wish to do harm to this great nation. The creators of these weapons are terrorists, quite frankly, plain and simple. Cyber terrorists who want to dis disrupt, disrupt our way of life and to cause considerable harm to our economy and infrastructure. And as with the terrorists that we are fighting with conventional means, these cyber terrorists are using the freedoms that we hold dear against us. They can unleash an attack on our soil from anywhere in the world, and we must be prepared. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this important hearing. Certainly protecting our nation's information infrastructure must be a top priority of the Congress. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. We'll uh, get right to the questions. Mr. Hale, what, what percentage of the federal government uh, had already downloaded the patch for Blaster prior to its release? Sir, Mr. Chairman, um, I don't have the exact figure with me. Um, it is safe to say that in the uh, approximately four weeks between the time the vulnerability was announced by um, Microsoft and the advisories from FedCERC were uh, issued, uh, the vast majority of agencies had downloaded the patches. And um, I will, given the opportunity, try to provide you a more uh, uh, me uh, measured answer in writing. What, what percentage of the, f of the federal government subscribes to FedCERC's program? Um, all federal agencies receive advisories from FedCERC. Uh, the PADC program in specific, 47 uh, federal agencies are currently subscribing to PADC. But um, PADC is just one part of uh, an agency's uh, patch management strategy. And um, many agencies have other methods of um, of getting their patches, testing them, and applying them. Uh, the information, the advisories provided by FedCERC go to all agencies. So then, Mr. Lorenz, how many different options are utilized by the, diff by the various agencies uh, to handle patch management? It sounds like some contract with the private sector, some do it internally, some subscribe to Pad C. So we've got a lot of different approaches to doing that. There are different approaches. Uh, we do not dictate which method that they use. Um, as part of our uh, FISMA oversight, we do require them to have specific plans, uh, risk mitigation, um, uh, patch management. Uh, we're soon to get the um, uh, annual FISMA reports uh, the 22nd of September on that. Uh, but the important issue here is, as you can tell from the testimony of everyone here, is that the only way we're protected is if all the dots are connected. The configuration management, the patch management, the management oversight to make sure that those processes are implemented as appropriate, the adherence to the information provided by FedCERC. So there can be variation in the tools, but there cannot be variation in the expected outcome or how those dots are connected in order to mitigate the problem. Mr. Malcolm, you mentioned an, an, a number of issues about the law enforcement approach to, compu to computer security. How many people have actually served time in jail for releasing malicious code, worms, viruses? Mr. Chairman, I'll have to get back to you with the precise answer. There are a couple of instances that immediately come to mind. Uh, one was Mafia Boy with the tremendous assistance of uh, law enforcement in the United States who was actually prosecuted in Canada. Uh, he ended up getting a sentence. There was also uh, David Smith, who was uh, arrested and charged and successfully prosecuted for releasing the Melissa virus. I believe he got a 20-month uh, term of imprisonment. I would add in that regard that the United States Sentencing Commission is currently reevaluating the guidelines as they apply to these sorts of offenses, and we expect significant increases. Uh, there have been other perpetrators who have been identified, of course. Uh, Mr. Parsons was alleged to, of course, I, I would add that he's only been charged. He is uh, presumed to be innocent. Uh, I don't know if convicted of those offenses what kind of prison term he would get. I can get back to you with a more precise answer to, as to that. You, you, we've heard testimony that there are hundreds of viruses per year and millions or even into the billions of damage done. 
is, is there a different attitude or is there a different approach about cyber crimes than, than there is about other types of crimes? Has our sentencing guidelines, has our judicial system, have our laws, has our legislative branch not kept up with the technology that can promulgate new types of, of threats? In terms of keeping up with the laws, obviously emerging technologies present all kinds of problems for law enforcement, uh, and so we need to constantly reevaluate the state of our laws. In the USA Patriot Act, for instance, uh, one of the provision provides now for nationwide service a process of pen trap orders and an explicit recognition uh, that pen trap orders apply to uh, non-content interceptions over the Internet. That is an important step in terms of conducting these sorts of investigations. I'm not going to suggest it's going to be the last such step that is necessary. It is certainly true uh, that as these worms and viruses become more sophisticated and proliferate uh, at a greater rate, the potential damage is real. I think historically there has been a perception that crimes taking place in the physical world are somehow more serious than crimes taking place over the cyber world. I believe that that perception is rapidly breaking down, and I expect the sentences and prosecutions to commensurately increase. Mr. Pethia, Carnegie Mellon's done as much or more work on this than, than anyone. Uh, I'd like you to comment on this, this different attitude. When, when we have conversations with the private sector, when, when I was in Silicon Valley, that, that this analogy is always used that people rattle their doorknobs, they rattle their locks thousands of times per day depending on which firm it is. Obviously you have high profile targets in, in, in uh, the IT world and, and some that are lower, but some are getting thousands of, of door rattlings per day and they choose not to report it. They don't want it to, uh, to give any uneasiness to shareholders or to consumers, so they just accept it as part of this internet culture and it results in hundreds, hundreds of true viruses per year. Is, is, is there a different attitude about the Internet and, and, and crime and consequences? Um, I, I don't know about different attitude, but I sense a certain complacency that people um, have become so accustomed to the problem and are often so overwhelmed with the problem uh, so unable on their own to change some of the root causes of the problem that they've simply chosen to live with it as best they can. Um, you're right, many organizations don't report uh, attacks, but on the other hand, many of these attacks are so trivial um, and so common that if you were to report them all, it's not clear what anyone would, would do with all, of that, with all of that data. In fact, separating the, the wheat from the chaff, the serious attacks from the trivial has become an increasing challenge for all of us who do any kind of incident response. B buried in the middle of all this noise are the serious attacks, like the blasters and the so bigs and the people who are, who are really intent to do malicious, malicious damage. But I think people are beginning to, I mean, I think the wide, there's widespread recognition that the problem is here and it's serious, but I think individuals don't know what they can do above and beyond putting controls in place in their own organizations. You, you, you don't think that there's a really necessarily a different attitude about it? Um, I, I, I think it's more of an attitude of complacency and acceptance and, and just frustration over not knowing what steps that they can take as individual organizations or as individuals to make a difference. Have you ever heard of something called a black hat convention? Sure. Uh, what, what is that? Um, there, are, there are a number of different con conferences. Uh, there, are, there are two that are typically held every year of people who talk about the black hat conference are are people who um, at one time wore black hats. They, they broke into and attacked computer systems. That particular conference now typically is, is uh, attended by white hats rather than black hats. But they talk about security problems. They talk about weaknesses in software. Uh, they talk about what can be done to improve the situation. They talk about, in some cases, how to exploit some of these problems. So they recognize uh, very much how widespread and serious this problem is, and in their own way, they try to take steps to, to get corrections out to the world. What, what percentage of those who are uh, attempting to hack into computers and, and, and exploit code vulnerabilities, what percentage of them are bright, capable teenagers seeing what they can do, and what percentage of them uh, are, are malicious? What percentage are based offshore? and what percentage are based domestically? Those are good questions, and I wish we had answers to those. Um, 
you know, we all have our guesses, but I don't know of anyone who's done any detailed studies about, let's call it the internet underground and what the composition of that culture is, or even what the economy is. There's an, there's an underground economy that's growing that trades in things like account names and passwords and social security numbers that are pirated and driver's license numbers that are pirated. And I don't think any of us really have a good understanding of what that culture is or how big it is or how many different kinds of uh, people play in it. One thing that is clear is that it is really literally child's play to be able to break into many of the systems that we have today. And when the level of skill needed to attack a system is so low, you can expect all kinds of players to come into that arena. When the conventioneers, whether they're wearing black hats or wearing white hats, when they come together out of the goodness of their heart to talk about ways to improve the system and, and uh, draw attention to different software companies' vulnerabilities, do they ever ask for money or credit or acknowledgement or anything in exchange for disclosing that information? Um, there certainly are cases where um, these individuals have tried to extort money from vendors uh, in order to not publicly disclose patches uh, or vulnerabilities in their products. Uh, we've certainly seen cases where individuals have tried to extort organizations because they've uh, uncovered weaknesses in their operational systems and, and have expected money in return not to make that public or to exploit those vulnerabilities in some way. Um, so there is a there is a maliciousness there in, in some cases. Mr. Malcolm, do you have any other comments about the, the source and origin and nature of these hackers? Are they pr primarily international, domestic, teens, professionals? I think you could really break that down into different categories in that you have a core group of committed, highly sophisticated hackers who come up with sophisticated worms and viruses. Uh, and then unfortunately, what they do frequently is there are chat rooms and internet sites, news groups, uh, in which hackers communicate. And literally, somebody who develops a very sophisticated hacking tool can put it out there so that so-called script kiddies, unsophisticated people who actually just happen to uh, go to that site can then utilize that tool. So the level of sophistication can vary dramatically among hackers. Uh, and unfortunately, because these tools are made available on the internet, lots of people can then implement them to cause damage. Uh, I think that because the internet is borderless and seamless and there are uh, people who are hell-bent on destruction and technically savvy around the world, you have perpetrators who are domestic and perpetrators who are international. Thank you very much. Mr. Clay? You recognize. Thank you. Let me uh, ask uh, any of the three, Mr. Dacey, Hale, and Lorenz, uh, did the Department of Homeland Security collaborate effectively with Microsoft and the antivirus companies uh, in the department's effort to issue advis advisories? And you can start, Mr. Lorenz. Um, in our view, um, the proof is in the results. The problems were, in, for the most part, in general, mitigated. Um, and that took, uh, there was two um, pieces of that. First of all was getting the information out about the remediation, which they did, and then was really uh, following up and holding the agencies accountable on our behalf to make sure of what the implementation was and reporting that back, and we did that in a manner so that we could share what people's experiences were. So in our view, uh, it was in both of these um, uh, incidents that we've had recently, they did a fine job. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Dacey, anything to in, add? In terms of that, I'd just like to, to add one thing. Yes, we, we did do some uh, analysis and gathered information with respect to the two vulnerabilities, the uh, Microsoft RPC and the Cisco. Uh, and in those cases, uh, there was a fairly active uh, discussion and reporting that took place on those two. Uh, as, as Mr. Lorenz indicated, for those two specifically, uh, which were deemed critical, uh, there were separate teleconferences and data requests that were sent out to agencies to ask you know, what they had done and whether or not they had patched their systems in response to them. Uh, I think that uh, is a process which has taken place, I, I believe, a few occasions prior to this uh, but I know that there's some opportunities there which OMB has acknowledged to improve that process uh, in making sure that people get communicated to in a, in a rapid manner uh, by standardizing processes and procedures for that communication to occur. 
Uh, but uh, I, would, I would also defer to Mr. Hale, who could probably speak more to the specifics of those interactions. Go ahead, Mr. Hale. Yes, sir. Um, I appreciate the, the, the remarks of my colleagues. And uh, just wanted to point out that um, those, as well as the uh, Cisco vulnerability, uh, the iOS vulnerability that occurred in the, in, during the past three months, have been the, um, the major events in, in uh, cyber incidents that have occurred since the formation of the National Cybersecurity Division. And so those are indicative of the kind of coordination and collaboration that this division um, has started to do and intends to build on um, to improve not only the uh, information sharing among the federal agencies, but also with the critical infrastructure protection community. Let me ask you, Mr. Hale, uh, in creating the Homeland Security Department, Congress moved the Federal Computer Response Team from GSA to Homeland Security. Uh, how has this move affected that group? Did anyone leave the agency rather than, rather than move, uh, as we saw with some other agencies? And did, did the move affect the group's ability to respond to any of the more recent attacks? Uh, the effect was entirely positive, sir. Um, the FedCERC was under GSA was uh, um, had a focus on the security of federal agencies and providing a service to federal agencies, our our customer base. And um, thanks to the provisions of, the, of FISMA, the Federal Information Security Management Act, FedCERC was able to remain focused on that mission and continue to provide our services to our customers. Um, we didn't lose any staff members as a result of. Uh, of going to the Department of Homeland Security. In fact, uh, recruiting to fill our vacancies became significantly easier because there were a lot of uh, people who were very interested in becoming a part of, uh, of our efforts to help uh, cybersecurity in the federal agencies. And by, um, by joining forces with the uh, National Infrastructure Protection Center and the other elements of IA and IP, we've actually improved our ability to gather, gather information and um, disseminate information to the uh, customer base. Wonderful. Uh, let, let me ask Mr. Malcolm, uh, recent viruses and worms uh, such as Code Red, NIMDA, uh, and Slammer have brought large portions of the Internet to a halt, uh, caused extensive expenses, expenses and lost revenue, uh, and consumed the attention of tens of thousands of com computer security professionals, uh, computer network administrators, and users. These are serious crimes. Uh, have law enforcement officials found and arrested the individuals responsible for these viruses and worm attacks? They've also consumed the time and attention of a lot of dedicated law enforcement agents. Uh, of course, the department doesn't comment about ongoing investigations. However, I think it is safe to say that with respect to each of the worms and viruses that you have identified, uh, those are all matters of ongoing investigation in which we work cooperatively with our uh, international counterparts. We have some successes, uh, as with the criminal complaint that's been filed in the variant B of the blaster worm, uh, but I think it is safe to say that there is a lot more work to be done, and unfortunately, we not only have to act retroactive, uh, retroactively, but because these worms and viruses come out weekly, we have to think prospectively as well. Are the individuals who are responsible for this attack, are they still at large today? Other than those that have been arrested either uh, here or overseas by international counterparts, yes, they're still at large unless they've died. And you, and you work uh, with international law enforcement to? 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And how many have you, have you arrested, though, out of, out of the viruses that I named, the three that I named, Code Red, Nimda, and Slammer? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I believe they are all matters of ongoing investigation. I'm not sure off the top of my head of any arrests in those particular uh, cases, but I can go back and check, and if there's anything that's a matter of public information, I'll be happy to furnish Would it to you. Would you share that with us? If it's public information, I certainly will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all questions. Thank you very much. Ms. Miller, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just ask a couple of questions here, but I think my nature of my questions are, are reiterating what all the committee members are, are talking about here and what is really happening as far as the attitude that our nation has and our Justice Department, our law enforcement has toward these cyber hackers. 
Um, you know, I was following in the papers here recently where the uh, recording industry has, has filed all these lawsuits against the file sharers. I don't know, 200 lawsuits or whatever. Well, obviously, that's not, it's not really terrorism unless you're a recording star and you're losing <laughs> all this money, right? But I was interested in the response of these college kids who are unloading, downloading all this music, and they're getting sued, and they said, well, we don't care about that. We're going to continue to down. I mean, their, their attitude is unbelievably cavalier, I think, to, uh, to breaking the law by using electronic uh, means to do so. And perhaps that is part of the problem that we have with these cyber hack hackers is the attitude of our legislature, of our law enforcement. I mean, are we serious enough? And as you were mentioning some of the, um, you know, is it, just, is it just college kids that are doing this? Obviously not. You've got the whole realm of uh, different kinds of people who are doing the cyber hacking. But have you ever done a psychological profile? I mean, these people are terrorists that are trying to shut down, as I was mentioning, power grids or those kinds of things. That's not downloading music. Uh, what what has your um, let, let, let me ask you first uh, about that as far as the Justice Department or law have, has there been a psychological profile? I mean, there must be some uh, some type of common trait, common element. These are like it would be like an arsonist, right? You, you see the uh, fire services do uh, uh, profiles of arsonists. These are people that uh, burn buildings and stand back, and uh, there's a whole profile about these kinds of people that uh, perpetrate that kind of crime. I'm not aware of any psychological profile. I think that perhaps I could contrast the situation with an arson in that unless somebody wants to literally kill somebody inside of a building, arsonists tend to be motivated by one purpose, and that is collecting insurance money. Uh, in terms of hackers, I think you run the gamut. Uh, you obviously have uh, perhaps terrorists who are interested in exploiting critical infrastructure for destructive ends. You can have political hacktivists who go on to deface web pages of something that they are protesting. You have sophisticated hackers who take pleasure in trying to stay one step ahead of the te technological developments of law enforcement and take pleasure in their ability to outwit law enforcement by masking their activities. And you also have, as I say, these script kiddies uh, that are moral lists with respect to their use of the computers uh, who are out there on a lark. They all cause harm of, uh, of varying degrees. We take them all seriously. Let me just ask one other question in regards to the Patriot Act. Uh, you mentioned the Patriot Act. In the Patriot Act, of course, there's been a lot of consternation uh, uh, talked about the Patriot Act of whether or not privacy, a lot of privacy advocates are concerned about the, uh, uh, how the Patriot Act is being implemented, how you are identifying and apprehending uh, culprits. I'm a, s a supporter of the Patriot Act, and I'm just wondering uh, how that particular tool has assisted the Justice Department uh, and our law enforcement. Uh, and, and are a lot of these concerns that are being raised about the Patriot Act Im Im uh, impeding your ability to uh, prosecute, apprehend people, identify them? Et cetera. How, does it, how is the Patriot Act helping you? Well, there are several questions in there that cut across a broad swath. Uh, let me respond to the more narrow question, then I can fill in as you would, would like me to. Uh, with respect to hacking investigations, any crime that is taking place online, time is absolutely of the essence. If you can catch somebody while they are in the act or trace their communications, uh, either in real time or very shortly thereafter, your odds of catching somebody go up dramatically. Uh, internet service providers don't retain records typically for a very long period of time, uh, and people can very quickly cover their tracks. Uh, there are a number of provisions in the Patriot Act that help. There's one, the hacker trespass exception. The Patriot Act, if somebody breaks into a system, the owner of that system now can give consent to the government to go in and track the activities of that hacker while they are taking place. Certainly the ability to go and get a pen trap order in one district and use that order to follow the communications from ISP to ISP to ISP to get those records frozen as quickly as possible has proven of invaluable assistance. Uh, there are other tools, such as nationwide service of process for search warrants, subpoenas, all of which have been instrumental in terms of these investigations. Thank you. My last question, just uh, to the panel, I suppose. Um, obviously, the federal government has our own role to play in protecting our own information and security systems and that. But I think the public needs to be educated on uh, security, computer security as well. Do you, the, I, I'm not sure who I'm asking this question to, any of the panelists, I suppose. Is there, uh, uh, do you have a feeling that there is a role for the federal government to play in regards to educating the general public about computer safety and how important it is? Um, I'm going to start just by saying I think that's that's something that we I think a strong role for the for the federal government um, and it needs to happen at 
across the country at, at people of all of all ages and all occupations um, starting at the elementary school level where, where we start very as we teach students about computer skills we need to teach them about computer ethics and the risks of, of working with computers and interacting in the internet age we teach our children how not to get into cars with strangers we should teach them how not to get into chat rooms with strangers just as well and so from there all the way up through the home user the retired home user uh, all of these people are vulnerable to some kind of problems because of uh, security or lack of security on the internet and I think there's a strong role for the government there to put together those kind of awareness and training programs and make them broadly available. I guess I would just add I think that, that the government has a responsibility to our citizens. We as part of the management agenda security is clearly one of the things we're looking at. It cuts across public and private sector activity. We do have a role in clearly communicating what's acceptable, what's not, creating that, that common language, if you will. And it, and it begins with um, exhibiting the behaviors that we would wish to see. I would uh, definitely endorse the statements. Um, in fact, with, uh, with home computers being connected and always on, um, it's nothing short of a patriotic duty to maintain the security of your home computer because it can be used to attack other computers by other people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Uh, Mr. Malcolm, what, are there differences uh, among nations in the laws regarding cyber crimes and are there other nations who have particularly more effective means of enforcing them? and have a greater success rate in prosecution? And are there certain countries that are more or less helpful to us in, in investigative work? I think the short answer to all of those questions was yes. Uh, there are a couple of things that I can say in that regard. Uh, one is uh, we cooperated with our international counterparts uh, throughout the world in terms of drafting the now, uh, well, it hasn't been ratified in this country, but the now implemented uh, Council in Europe Cybercrime Convention. One of the beauties of the Cybercrime Convention, in addition to encouraging uh, international cooperation, is that it mandates signatory countries to uh, update their substantive and procedural laws with respect to computer hacking offenses, which would include worms and viruses. Uh, we also have. It updates them to a, presumably, a certain standard. That's right. And, in and fact, are we already at that standard in the United States? Well, we're constantly retinkering, but yes, we try to uh, maintain the highest standard that we can. We work cooperatively with Congress in that uh, endeavor. And I would add that the Department of Justice, although not uniquely the Department, State Department certainly too, goes overseas and works with legislators and law enforcement officers in other countries to try to keep their uh, laws updated as well through other entities such as the G8, there is a, uh, a high-tech unit, it's called a 24-7 network, in which we are able to communicate with law enforcement counterparts in these br fast-breaking investigations uh, on a moment's notice, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There are 30 countries that are members of the uh, high-tech 24-7 network. We are encouraging other countries to join. Some countries have uh, better facilities, training, more money to devote this to this effort than other countries, but we're encouraging all of them to uh, stay current. But you're not aware of any one particular area of the world that is a source of more hacking attempts than another? I could answer that question with respect to Internet piracy. With respect to uh, hacking, uh, I don't know the answer to that question, Congressman. Mr. Pethia, did you? Um, no, well, not, not, not that it's been sustained over any long period of time. Um, for a while, there were a number of viruses that for some reason came out of Bulgaria. Um, and you see, you see, you know, see, uh, short periods of time where you'll see an increase of activity from some geographic area, but nothing that I know of that's sustained over a long period of time. Well, we may hear more about this in, in later panels. Uh, for the OMB, how, how long does it take? Because everyone has different patch management systems, are you able to, me to measure how long it takes for all of the computers to download the patch when a particular vulnerability is, is released and the patch is also then released? Do you know when everyone has, has taken advantage of it? 
I can add, I can answer the more management aspect of that, and I let Larry get into the technical because they basically act as our agent in that. But we we literally are advised to the vulnerability. We call attention to the vulnerability. FedCERC makes uh, the agencies aware of what the remediation of the patch is, and then we specifically set a time to get back to monitor um, the adherence to the remediation. And it's in the last two uh, incidences, that's exactly what we did. Um, and I would feel quite sure that FedCERC probably has some cycle time issues um, that they can look at as far as how, how long it actually takes. But, uh, you know, there's, there's two aspects to all of this. The most significant aspect is the management aspect, and that is holding people accountable once they know, and it's mutually accountable to CIOs as well, once they know that there is, a, there is a, a, uh, an incursion that the patch has to be applied and that there's accountability to, to apply it. And there's obviously the technical uh, nature of things, and there's a number of technical capabilities that are, that are equally effective. But I would pass it to Larry on the, on the uh, cycle time question. The, uh, for the 47 subscribers of Pad C, we can tell when they download. Uh, but even that is, um, can be a misleading statistic because one download can serve thousands of computers. Um, and um, an agency may download one time and, and take care of their whole uh, enterprise with that. So um, we've tried developing metrics with, uh, with industry, with the software manufacturers, and that's, uh, that's the constant refrain is um, it's, you can't measure how many computers have been inoculated by a single download, but it, it is the best thing we've got is to, uh, to, to tell that, um, that agencies are downloading uh, the patches. Now, with the PADC system, agencies can also, once they've inoculated their systems, they can enter in uh, the report and say, it, it requires a manual entry, but say that we've uh, completed 90% or we've completed 99% uh, or 100% of computers affected by this vulnerability. So there's a method built in for reporting back. Mr. Malcolm, if someone were to break into Coca-Cola's headquarters in Atlanta and go into the office and steal the recipe for Coca-Cola, what, what would be a ballpark estimate of, of if, assuming they were arrested and convicted, what type of consequence would they face for that? Uh, sadly, Mr. Chairman, there are a lot of variables that would go into answering that question. Ballpark, I'm not a judge. Well, you know, I mean, you know, in addition to trademark infringement theft, I, I, would, I would estimate statutory penalties 10 years or so, depending on whether or not the person has a prior record, that would obviously affect their sentencing guidelines. I, I, there are just too many variables for me to answer that question without having the guideline book in front of me. But I think, uh, obviously, the factors are what are the charges, what is the severity of the loss, what is the person's past criminal record? Well, what, what would it be if they hacked into Coca-Cola's computer system and downloaded the secret recipe? Same answer. You would have all sorts of variables, such as whether or not they've abused a position of trust, what was the damage that they caused. Uh, it could be, obviously, in the case of Coca-Cola, a major company, a major loss, a significant period of time. Would it be significantly different than had they physically taken it? There are different guidelines factors that would take into account the fact that a computer was used and special skills were used, and depending on who this person was, whether or not they abused a position of trust. There are, under the sentencing guidelines, it's just there are too many individual case-specific factors for me to give you an accurate answer to your question. I think it is safe to say that if this was uh, a major product and caused a serious loss, I would expect the dollar figure to be high, and that would dramatically increase the sentence since the major a uh, factor that is taken into effect by the sentencing guideline is the loss to the victim. Okay. There are hundreds of viruses released every year, according to the testimony of this panel. The damages range into the billions, according to your testimony. Yes. But you could only recall two arrests, two convictions, two jail times. You mentioned David Smith and, and one other. Now, I asked, what's the source of the threat? Well, I, we really don't know. Is it foreign or domestic? Well, we really don't know. That seems to reinforce a premise 
that cybercrime is treated vastly different than some other crime that caused billions in damage and shut down power grids and shut down departments of trans transportation and threatened security systems in, within and without the government. It would suggest that there is a different approach, a different attitude, a different level of concern about cybercrime. Would you agree or disagree with that? I would reject that implication totally. Uh, there are, of course, other instances in which perpetrators have been identified. For instance, the fellow in the Philippines uh, who promulgated and released the I Love You virus. Uh, I would also say uh, that there are, uh, you know, <laughs> the Department of Justice is well aware, as is the Department of Homeland Security, that cyber vulnerabilities are among the most critical problems that we have and could have a dramatic impact in terms of protecting our critical infrastructure. These are unusually complicated uh, investigations in which very sophisticated people are very good at covering their tracks. To somehow suggest that just because there are fewer public arrests out there in the media that this is not an absolutely high, high, high priority at the Department of Justice would be a completely wrong uh, assumption to make. Okay. I'll take it your word. Any other questions from the subcommittee members? Very well. We will dismiss panel one and seat panel two as quickly as possible. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your input. And uh, for those of you who can, we would encourage you to stay around and listen to the private sector comments as well. Very well, the subcommittee will reconvene. I'd ask the panel two to please rise and be sworn in. Raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you'll give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? Note for the record that all the witnesses responded in the affirmative. We appreciate you being seated as quickly as possible, and we will move straight to your testimony. I would ask that you be as good about maintaining our five-minute rule as the first panel was. Our first witness is Mr. Gerhard Eschelbeck, overseeing Qualys' engineering and operations. Gerhard Eschelbeck is responsible for protecting over 1,100 corporate networks. He is an internationally recognized security and distributed systems expert and was recently recognized as one of the 25 most influential CTOs by InfoWorld Media Group. Prior to joining Qualys, Gerhard was senior VP of engineering for security products at Network Associates, vice president of engineering at of antivirus products at McAfee Associates. He was a research scientist at the University of Linz, Austria, from which he earned a master's and PhD degrees in computer science. He has authored many articles and papers and is inventor of numerous patents in the field of network security automation and is a frequent speaker at networking and security conferences worldwide. Welcome. Glad to have you at the subcommittee and you're recognized. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, 
Thank you for the invitation to testify about my research on network vulnerabilities. The business of my company gives us a front row seat to new threat against network computers and communication systems. Qualys provides an automated service over the web to audit the security of networks. I've just analyzed more than 1.2 million network vulnerabilities found by our scanning service during the re recent 18 month period. This vast data pool demonstrates that known risks are far more prevalent than anyone has imagined. Analytical data also demonstrates a new breed of automated internet-borne viruses and worms that mock traditional security defenses. The source of data for my analysis was anonymous results from 1.5 million security audit scans made by organizations worldwide. We learned four themes that are called the laws of vulnerabilities. The law of half-life talks about the fact that it takes on average about 30 days for organizations to fix 50% of their vulnerable systems within enterprises. The law of prevalence talks about the fact that half of the most prevalent and critical vulnerabilities are replaced by new ones each and every year. The law of persistence, some old vulnerabilities recur due to deployment of unpatched software as part of new rollouts. The law of exploitation, finally, talks about the fact that 80% of the vulnerability exploits are available within 60 days of public announcements. Automating defenses against these threats is crucial because human-based efforts are not working. In each case of recent damaging strikes, we've had advanced warning weeks, even months to prepare for known vulnerabilities. Yet, attackers still were able to hit hundreds of thousands of PCs and servers. Risks to networks and system security are increasing because their triggers are becoming automated, requiring no human action to deliver destructive payloads. Earlier, first-generation threats are virus-type attacks spreading with email and file sharing. They require human action to trigger, such as opening an infected file attachment. An example would be the most recent Sobeek virus. Second-generation threats comprise active worms leveraging system and application vulnerabilities. Penetration occurs without requiring user action. Replication, identification, and targeting of new victims are automatic. Blended threats are common, such as incorporating viruses and trojans. A third generation of threats is now posing trouble. We've already seen the potential for damage. The SQL Slammer worm rapidly hit more than 75,000 hosts and co running Microsoft SQL Server and caused major damage worldwide. SQL Slammer was the fastest worm ever, infecting more than 90% of the vulnerable systems within 10 minutes. A few days after Microsoft published the DCOM vulnerability in July 2003, Qualys' automated scanning service ranked this security vulnerability as the most prevalent vulnerability ever. Following the laws of vulnerabilities, Blaster and its derivatives appeared three weeks later infecting more than 100,000 systems per hour at its peak. Urgency is now rising from a shortening discovery attack cycle. SQL Slammer happened six months after discovery. Ninda was four months, Slapper was six weeks, and Blaster and Nachi came just three weeks after news of the vulnerability. Public policy for network security should strongly encourage the use of automation as an equal force response to automated tools used by attackers. Automating defense strategies include regular security audits of networks and systems, keeping antivirus software up to date, timely patch management, and the ongoing evaluation of security policy. To summarize, many vulnerabilities linger, sometimes without an end. New attacks are capable of spreading faster than any possible human response effort. Protecting our networks is a continuous process of eliminating critical vulnerabilities on a regional, national, and international scale. In conclusion, public policy should demand timely detection and rapid application of remedies providing protection from this threat. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward for your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Eschelbeck. Our next witness is Chris Wasopel. Mr. Wasopel is Director of Research and Development at At Stake, Inc., managing At Stake's pioneering research and application security. 
His primary focus is building products to assure and test software security. Working with vendors and the general public, Mr. Wysopel is also responsible for managing at stake's vulnerability research and disclosure process. His career in the information security industry has spanned over 13 years where he has held positions in industry while also serving as regular advisor to various government agencies. Prior to joining at stake, Mr. Wysopel was senior security engineer at GTE Internet Working, formerly known as BBN, where he was the most senior engineer on the IT security staff. In addition, Mr. Wasopo is co-author of the award-winning password auditing program, LC3, which is used by more than 2,000 government, military, and corporate organizations worldwide. And finally, as a founding, he is a founding member of the Organization for Internet Safety. Welcome to the subcommittee. We look forward to your testimony. Chairman Putnam and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today on the subject of protecting the nation's computers from viruses and worms. This is a great honor for me. My company at stake consults for the Fortune 1000, including four of the world's top software companies. We help them build more secure software and secure their infrastructures. I am also a founding member of the Organization for Internet Safety. OAS is a group of software vendors and security companies joined together to produce a process for reporting and responding to new vulnerability information safely. Today I would like to cover three pertinent issues, the software development process, the vulnerability research process, and finally, responsible vulnerability reporting and response. Unfortunately, in less than 72 hours, if an unpatched new computer is connected to the Internet, it will be compromised. This is indicative of the software flaws that affect our information economy. This brings me to my first point on software development. The root cause of the problem is software flaws. Every virus or worm takes advantage of a security flaw in the design or implementation of a software program. The flaw can exist almost anywhere inside a program that processes data directly from a network or from a file delivered by an email attachment. This means that practically every software program in this age of the Internet falls into the category of requiring security quality processes during its development. If these processes are not in place and followed rigorously by the manufacturer, flaws will inevitably inevitably creep into the software during development, be discovered, and end up exploited by virus and worm riders. Automate, automatic patching is a great solution for some computers, but many environments have requirements that don't allow patches to be applied in automatic or even timely manual manner. One of the key problems with patching is the internet, or the network the computer is connected to, is the distribution system. This means that a computer needs to be connected to the internet to be patched. The irony is the internet is the attack vector that puts the computer at risk. As recent examples of worms demonstrate, reactive solutions are not keeping up with the speed of malicious programs. Many of the flaws found in software after it is shipped to customers are not found by the vendor. Many are found through directed research by vulnerability researchers. These are individuals who investigate the security of software for academic reasons, profit, or mere curiosity. A primary motivation of vulnerability researchers is altruistic. There aren't any independent or government watchdog groups looking out for the safety of the software computer users use. Given this vacuum, researchers feel that someone should test and find vulnerabilities. They feel that every flaw they find and report is another flaw that will be fixed before a malicious person finds and exploits it. In this way, vulnerability researchers can make all computer users more safe. Vulnerability researchers are performing a security testing function that should have been done as part of the security quality assurance process by the vendor. Vulnerability researchers think differently than traditional software testers. They think from the perspective of an attacker. The fact that there are a vast amount of software already deployed with latent undiscovered flaws means that we will be dealing with newly discovered vulnerabilities for the foreseeable future. A process for handling new vulnerability information in a timely and safe way is required. There is some debate in the vulnerability research community as the best way to handle vulnerability information. However, most agree that it is responsible to inform the vendor of the vulnerable product and give them time to create a patch. 4,200 vulnerabilities were tracked by CERT last year. Almost all had patches available when the information became public due to vulnerability researchers informing vendors prior to publicly disclosing. 
The Organization for Internet Safety has published a process that these flaw finders can use to report flaws to vendors and for vendors to respond to these reports, sometimes with a patch. The goal of the OIS process is to protect the computer user community as a whole. A balance was struck between the timeliness and reliability of patches and between helping sophisticated users and the majority of users who are unable to help themselves. To conclude, software vendors face challenges building secure software. Vulnerability researchers can help find the flaws that vendors miss. Both need to come together to handle vulnerabilities safely. OIS is a step in this direction. Viruses and worms are shutting down government offices and businesses for days. The impact grows each year. When a technology contains dangerous unseen risks, we should have assurances that it is built properly. We need the, quote, electrical code for building software, and we need a way to assure that the code is followed. This will reduce the risk of insecure software at its source and strengthen the computer infrastructure for us all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your input. Our next witness is Ken Silva. As Vice President for VeriSign's Networking and Information Security, Mr. Silva oversees the mission critical infrastructure for all network security and production IT services for VeriSign. In this role, he oversees the mission critical network infrastructure for VeriSign's three core business units, security services, naming and directory services, and telecommunications services. His responsibilities include oversight of the technical and network security for the definitive database of over 27 million web addresses in .com and .net, the world's most recognizable top-level domains. Additionally, Mr. Silva coordinates the security oversight of VeriSign's public key infrastructure security systems. Mr. Silva serves on the board of directors for the Information Technology, Information Sharing and Analysis Center and the executive board of the Internet Security Alliance. He advises and participates in a number of national and international committees for organizations and he joined VeriSign with more than 20 years experience in the telecommunications and security industry in his portfolio. Welcome to the subcommittee. We're delighted to have you. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, other members of the subcommittee. VeriSign is pleased to have the opportunity to provide our views on the epidemic of virus and worm attacks that continue to threaten the integrity and security of information systems we've all uh, come to depend. VeriSign as a company is perhaps uniquely situated to observe the continuing assaults on our information infrastructure. Our company provides industry-leading technologies in three relatively distinct yet interrelated lines of business. These include telecommunications infrastructure services, managed security and payment processing services, directory and naming services. Our naming services is the business dedicated to the management of the domain name system. Uh, including our operation of the A and J root servers. These are two of the servers uh, that allow you, of the 13 servers that allow you to find www.house.gov of the hundreds of millions of machines on the internet. It will direct you to the correct one. Uh, in addition to that, for the last 10 years, we've managed the .com and .net top level domains. <clears throat> Since 2000, I've managed VeriSign's resources dedicated to maintaining the security of these complex technology assets. Today I'd like to make three key points. Uh, first, we should not underestimate the significance of these attacks. Although the most recent worms and viruses have been labeled by some as non-destructive, uh, they've cost American business estimates of $3.5 billion in August alone. Uh, we can only imagine what the cost would have been had these destroyed data along their path. Second, we should accept our shared responsibilities. Each of us has a responsibility. This includes lawmakers, government agencies, industry, and private citizens. Government has a role both as a model of, better, of good security practices as well as a thought leader in global security. Our citizens must be educated. We teach our children how to use computers in school, but do we teach them how to use them responsibly? Third, we must resist the temptation to demonize individual participants in the network community. Uh, the finger pointing is in general neither accurate nor helpful. Uh, it's all too easy to blame the operating system manufacturer for flaws in their code or the network providers for not securing their networks. Many of the worms attack not only popular operating systems but open source software as well. Mr. Chairman, there are measures which will over time improve the security posture of our network but there is no silver bullet that will miraculously solve our network security challenges. VeriSign's role over the past decade 
has led us to make significant investments in network hardware, engineering, and research and development. Armed with that knowledge, we can deploy and advise others on the network how to deploy the very best configurations and maintain the stable and secure functioning of the Internet. VeriSign's unique monitoring capabilities allow us to watch as a virus propagates around the global network. As a result of VeriSign's constant vigilance, we're often among the first to recognize it as, a, as an attack develops. You can see the view graph up here shows our global constellation. Um, I brought another slide with me, which is an example uh, of the graphic data that we're able to monitor. Um, this one shows the propagation of the Sobig F virus in just a short six-hour span on August 19th. There's another one following that, uh, the next view graph, please, which today just happens to be the very day that this virus has decided to disarm itself. This was taken this morning. Following the 9-11 attacks, we provided some of these monitoring capabilities to both the Defense Department's NCS and the FBI's NIPC to enable them to observe and detect anomalous traffic on the network. Our long experience in the most recent events like Blaster Worm reveal fundamental truths about our networks and the attacks. A few years ago, these things took months or weeks to propagate. Now they propagate in hours or minutes. Not only are the weapons behaving more aggressively, they're increasing in their uniqueness, making selection of appropriate countermeasures difficult and uncertain. As a result of this growing risk and our growing dependency on our networks, I believe we must face up to the reality that these network attacks are every bit as threatening as physical attacks on our critical infrastructures, warranting serious attention to strategies to defend against them and remedy their impact. Even when they don't bring down the network of a targeted site, uh, the insult to the network's integrity still has observable and measurable consequences. Another level of damage these attacks fundamentally threaten the core assets of the Internet, including, <coughs> including the Internet root servers and top-level domains. There are larger costs to these attacks. I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to appear before you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Silva, and uh, I appreciate your, all of you limiting your remarks to the five minutes. Mr. Silva, I get the impression that you had to, to cut yours a little bit short, so I'm going to give you the opportunity to expand on it by asking my first question about root servers. Uh, the expand, if you will, just take us in, in non-technical terms to their role in the architecture of the Internet and, and what their vulnerabilities have been in the past two viruses and worms and, and, and what impact that could have on, on in, in economic terms. Okay. Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, uh, the root servers are sort of the top of the, uh, the Internet naming system, if you will. Um, there's an invisible period at the end of every domain name that people don't see, and that happens to be the root. And then from there it goes .com, then, you know, Microsoft.com and then www, etc. They're sort of at that very top level. No other computers can be found without the information that these provide. And then there's another layer down from that, um, which VeriSign also operates um, for .com and .net. Um, the so big F worm in particular had a unique uh, vulnerability for the not vulnerability, but a unique uh, attack that it presented on the A root server and that the A and B root servers were, um, it's where that, that worm first looked to find out where an email was supposed to be sent. Okay, so if they wanted to send it to, you know, uh, anyone, uh, it would simply look to the root server first to find out where that mail server was. Uh, now in the blaster worm, uh, that didn't actually have an impact directly on the root servers themselves because uh, there was no protocol that the root servers were running or uh, a particular name lookup that was required for that worm to spread. You mentioned and, and other panelists have uh, made allusions to open source versus proprietary. Uh, is one less vulnerable than the other, or if you would just comment a bit on, on this age-old debate between proprietary and, and open source software, okay. beginning with Mr. Wysopel. Let Mr. Silva think about his for a second. Um, the, uh, the, 
the, the, uh, the theory with open source software is that it can be made more secure because there's more eyes. Every single user has the potential, if they have the skill set, to find flaws in that software and then correct them for themselves or notify the maintainer to correct them. With proprietary software, the user has no way, really, of looking deeply into the software by examining the code. But practically, um, users of open source software are not expert code reviewers and don't have the time to actually review the code. So we, we see vulnerabilities um, sort of in equal proportion in both the open source world and in the proprietary software world. Mr. Silva? Yeah, I, I, I would agree mostly with, with, what he, with what he said, except that um, there, there always has been this statement that um, in the open source world, the source code's available, and you know, if you were running it, you could certainly look at it. Um, I doubt seriously that you would. Um, w w nor would, you know, 99.99% of the rest of the people who use it. Um, in addition to the people who use the software not necessarily being expert code reviewers, in, in many of the cases, the people who actually write the software are not necessarily expert software writers either. So um, uh, it's not that it's bad software, it certainly is good software, but it's no more or less vulnerable than the software that goes through rigid configuration management and, and software review standards. Mr. Eschelbeck, would you like to wade in? I, I do not necessarily see a, a relation between open source versus closed source from a um, vulnerability prevalence perspective. I don't think there is any analytical data that would uh, um, uh, support that. However, I do believe strongly that software that's more popular, more widely used out there has been reviewed much more widely and more popular, and that's one of the main reasons why I think there is more vulnerabilities known about a software that's used widely rather than a software package that's not used at all out there. What would be the impact of, in, in terms of improved internet security, if, if any, of the next generation of internet, you know, the IPv6, does that in any way alter security concerns? I don't think IPv6 really uh, alters the security concerns. What IPv6 does is it makes many more internet addresses available um, so that we could have an internet address for you know, your wristwatch or, or, or any small object. You could have thousands or millions of times more internet addresses with IPv6. Um, it doesn't really address any security issues. Well, I, I, actually it does address some security issues, although probably not for the masses. Um, there are protocols that are part of the IPv6 um, uh, standard that would um, allow better authentication between IP addresses as they connect. Um, some of those capabilities have since been transferred to IPv4, such as the IPsec, um, which is what many of the VPN tunnels use today. But for the general web server, uh, probably not. You know, if just for the average computer on the network that doesn't need to authenticate every single user, it's probably not going to offer anything new for them. Mr. Eschelbeck, you wish to add anything? I would see exactly the same way. I think there is a lot of improvements in IPv6, and it's clearly the right step in the right direction, but there are still pieces missing that we don't do in IPv6 today, like in the new protocols that are coming up. And particularly, if you look from a vulnerability perspective, IPv6 is not going to address the vulnerability problem. And that's really the reality why we are here today, why we are looking for vulnerabilities and how to address them. So IPv6 is certainly the way to move from an authentication, from an encryption perspective, and it will fix some of those underlying issues, but will not fix all the security issues that we are facing today. Thank you. I will stop there and recognize the ranking member, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, any one of you can attempt to answer uh, these questions. Let me, let me start off by asking, uh, what motivates people to engage in, in computer hacking? Um, and let me, let's, let's start on this end of the table. <laughs> I do think that there is Obviously, if you look back in history, mostly what we have seen, some of the attacks, really didn't have any specific target in mind. They were mostly like, who is the first who is going to launch a worm on the Internet? And that was the results, what we have seen in traffic congestion and things like that. But I clearly see uh, moving forward motifs in mind. If I look at BLAST, that was probably the biggest turning point that we have seen here. 
by Blaster introducing the ability to, to deliver a payload that actually does something malicious other than just creating noise on the internet. And this, in this particular case with Blaster, was the denial of service attack against Microsoft. And I do see some trend here that there's clearly an opportunity for uh, more active payloads coming in, in future worms there that are motivated by motifs that we don't know and fully understand at this point at all. I, I think the main motivation is, is experimentation and exploration. But these people who do this uh, experimentation don't take into account any, any, any sense of ethics, and they don't really care um, what, that their experiments cause, cause harm to others. Mr. Silva, what do you I think don't really have anything to add you that has already okay. been said. Uh, let me ask you, there has been much discussion about information sharing on cyber vulnerability issues between the government and the private sector. And, and within the private sector, are there any legal or policy barriers that continue to impede information sharing and cooperation? Mr. Silver, we can start with you. Well, um, there, are, there are a number of issues related to antitrust, okay, that have that have that have been raised amongst companies sharing information amongst a select group of people that's not publicly available. Um, more recently, or excuse me, prior to that, one of the issues was uh, was FOIA. Quite frankly, sharing information between government and industry, uh, and having you know the possibility that a publicly traded company with you know some known vulnerability that they ex that they made that information available to the government would somehow be available through FOIA. Uh, some some uh, action has been taken in that direction, uh, but those are probably the two main impediments there. Uh, I think another main impediment uh, impediment is uh, companies um, trying to refrain from being uh, looking being embarrassed. Basically, uh, a lot of companies, such as financial service companies, banks, um, are sort of the most trusted institutions, and people expect that they're you know the highest level of assurance to protect their you know their money, their privacy. And uh, it's, it, it could be embarrassing. It could be a competitive advantage of some of their competitors to say, you know, put your, put your money with us. You know, your privacy will really be protected with us. They say they do, but look at this, this, and this. So I think a lot of it is competition and, and fear of embarrassment. Interesting. Yes. I would actually agree with, uh, with Chris's statement. I would wanted to add one point here. What we see as well is that um, those areas, those sectors in general, that are, have legislation for uh, auditing requirements, for security auditing requirements, we, su we see a bigger sense of urgency there in comparison to some of the areas that are not legislated today. Uh, going back to attacks and computer hacking, do any of you have any knowledge uh, of foreign governments involved in cyber attacks and, and uh, how, how is that different from hackers attacking for the fun of it? Let's start with you, Mr. Ryan. Um, it, it's very difficult to say um, where, where some of the malicious code, the exploit code that's written, or where some of this vulnerability research comes from. Um, it, it's difficult to say whether it's a foreign government or it's just an individual in a foreign country. We, we certainly see, um, when we see some malicious code, we certainly see levels of sophistication that are equal to the most sophisticated in the world coming from countries such as China, which is it's fairly easy to tell because of the, because of the language differences where, where some of this is coming from. Um, but it's, it's very difficult to tell whether it's actually government sponsored or just academics or just, you know, black hats. Anybody else got anything there, Mr. Silver? <clears throat> well, I, I think that probably law enforcement intelligence uh, representatives could probably answer the question of, as to the foreign sponsorship of, of the hacking probably better than any of us here could. Uh, but I have to say that I think we shouldn't, most of these, at least from the people that, that from earlier testimony have actually been caught, the few that have actually been caught, have turned out to be young adults or teenagers. So I don't, while I think we should be concerned about terrorist sponsorship or state-sponsored hacking and malicious activity, I think we should definitely not discard the fact that the vast majority of these appear to be coming from, you know, pranksters. 
okay, and that have no political affiliation or, or governmental sponsorship. So I, while I think it's important that we know if it is state sponsored, I don't think that all of our efforts should be focused in that direction. Okay. Um, per, per, perhaps any one of you can uh, take a stab at this, but can the federal government use its procurement power to improve the security of computer software? Anybody have a thought on that one? I, I, th I think definitely. Uh, the, the federal government buys, um, is probably the largest purchaser of, of, of technology, especially software. And um, w one thing that doesn't happen when people purchase software is an acceptance test for the security of that software. Sometimes there's acceptance testing that it has certain features or that it has a certain level of performance. But acceptance testing for software is more, uh, for security is more expensive and time consuming, so no one really does it. Um, if the federal government was to do that, uh, the benefits would be all the users of that software because the, the, the federal government could say, you know, we, 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 we spent a lot of money and tested this and we rejected it and you need to go back to the drawing board and build something secure. I think if that happened, every, all the other users of the software would say, or potential purchasers of the software would think twice about buying it if the government wasn't willing to use it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Ms. Miller? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to pick up on the ranking member's uh, question here a bit. I, I think we are all struggling with this panel, uh, the members of the committee with this panel, on understanding what is the appropriate role of the federal government. Uh, and you're in the private sector. and. Uh, um, I mean, I'm a person that generally thinks that less government is better and less government regulation is better, but because our society is becoming so unbelievably dependent on the Internet, on computers, on communication, for communication purposes, for security purposes, for uh, everything, uh, I'm just one, I mean, the, the, the term vulnerability researcher, I, I guess I'd never really heard that before as I'm listening to you say it. Now it's going to probably be part of the, my nomenclature here, but it's very descriptive. I can understand uh, what you are talking about there. But do you think, uh, and again, this is just for the panel, do you think that the federal government, first of all, has a role, an oversight role? Should we be using our purchasing power to uh, put standards, set standards out for software? Uh, what is the fine line of the government not overregulating a private industry, uh, but uh, certainly having consternation about uh, some of the security problems that are inherent in software. Um, where, where would your, what would your suggestion be on how far you think uh, the government should be going here and what is the appropriate action uh, for the federal government? I mean, we just had this huge power outage in my state of Michigan, and I'm, we're looking to the Public Service Commission to regulate an industry, right? And I mean, I'm trying to understand everything about the energy policy of our nation, but I could not tell you what the proper amount for a person to pay for per kilowatt hour actually is. We rely on the experts for that. You're the experts in the software industry, and I think uh, we're, we're trying to struggle to understand what we need to do appropriately without overstepping the, our bounds into the private sector. Um, well. One one um, place where I think it's important for the government to regulate is when we get to the when we get to issues of safety. You know, when we're talking about cars or airplanes or chemicals or things like that, um, regulation of safety is is, is important. Um, the trend that's happening with computers is they used to be you know something that you'd write documents with and in sort of just uh, what safety wasn't an issue. But now when we're seeing these networks becoming interconnected with things like the power grid actually being connected directly to the internet, um, you know, through maybe a few gateways, but, you know, the worms got in, you know, the worms can, can get inside, we start to get to the issue of, of safety. And, and uh, that's a place where I think, um, I think some regulation is appropriate. Um, you know, the, the software industry is a fast-moving, dynamic industry, and putting any regulation on it um, is, is certainly going to slow down innovation. There's no doubt about it. But uh, maybe it's time to think about some limited um, um, safety regulations. I think that uh, there, there is a, a fundamental role of our government whether federal government or state government, to provide education to our people, to our citizens. Um, 
If any of you happen to have a DSL or a cable modem at home and were to actually install a firewall on it and look at the logs, you'd be shocked at the number of times that, you know, penetration attempts actually hit your machine. It, it, would, be, it, would, it would just boggle your mind. It really would. Um, but as I said in my testimony, the, or in my statement, the, uh, uh, we, we teach our children in, in almost every school in the country now, we teach them how to use computers, you know, how to use a word processor, how to boot a disk, but, but we don't actually teach them how to responsibly use the computers and what the consequences of their action or inaction actually are. So uh, that's a role I think that the federal government can play as well as state government. I think there is uh, two areas looking at, at it. On the one side, we have obviously existing infrastructure that we need to look at, that we need to look from a security perspective. And that's probably going to uh, give us um, an effort for the next still five or 10 years. Uh, and there is specific ideas how, how, those, how those could be handled. However, there is also the new software aspect, as when new software comes out there, there is standards in place like common criteria that are being used to secure or to approve uh, security software. Such standard, uh, standards are not existing for any commercial type uh, application. So I'm not asking for common criteria type certification for any type of software, but some lightweight certification uh, would give at least a seal of approval from a security perspective uh, as part of new software technology that's coming out there. And as far as the existing infrastructure that we have in place today, I think we have to give the leadership perspective infrastructure so that they can measure. The key part is, how do I measure security today? There is no tools, no metrics defined or well-defined metrics out there. And I think we have to give the leadership in the government and, and industry as well uh, infrastructure tools and ways to measure their security so that they can say, uh, I'm at the level four, I'm at the level five, and in comparison to other agencies, for example, I'm at this level. So there is ways I think those could be accomplished by putting infrastructure in place there. No other questions, just a comment that I've, I'm, I'm certainly picked up from both of the panels is how important it is for education. Uh, and, it, you know, really the Internet is, is still a relatively new phenomenon in many instances. I mean, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, many people in this room had not really heard of the Internet or were not using it uh, every day. But the children now, of course, I mean, it may, perhaps it's generational, they're leaping onto these computers. I was struggling yesterday trying to download my boarding pass and all of these things keep coming up on my computer saying, you know, download this, or excuse me, upload this right now or your computer's going to blow up or something. I mean, I'm trying to understand it all. But uh, at any rate, uh, I certainly appreciate uh, the testimony here today. And, uh, and I think the government certainly recognizes, um, again, that society is becoming so uh, uh, dependent on, uh, on electronic uh, technology and how important it is for, the, uh, for every generation to understand uh, what the implications are of some of the cyber hacking and uh, how important it is for them to be able to use these tools uh, properly and uh, understand the ramifications of, uh, of what they're up to. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Mr. Wasopel, if you would, uh, you, you probably made the most extensive comments about researchers. Tell us a little bit about the category of researchers who would not be classified as altruistic uh, and, and their motivations and, and I'm not asking you to psychoanalyze them, but I mean, how, how big a group are we talking about? What do they seek money? Do they seek fame? Do they seek, is it, is it simply the thrill of being able to discover the source code? Please, please elaborate. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's mostly um, sort of the thrill of having having power over computers that uh, on, on the internet. Part of part of the um, the way that they keep score is how many systems you know have you compromised. You know how how uh, the vulnerability that you discovered and wrote um, exploit tools for or malicious code for. How many computers can you compromise with, with, with that? So you know a bug that was exploited in a, 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 a software package that was used by 100 people, you know, no one would care about. But if you find a bug in a Microsoft piece of software, which is used by millions of people, then, uh, you know, you're, you're looked amongst your malicious peers as, uh, as more important and, and, a, and, a, and a better black hat. Um, and this is definitely, definitely a, a very serious problem that people are able to find these vulnerabilities, and usually they keep them to themselves. 
They, they, don't, um, they don't tell the vendors. They keep them to themselves or share amongst a small group of people so they can go into computers with impunity on the Internet and know that that problem won't be patched. And that's a very difficult problem to control. The only way to really control that is to actually design the software without the flaws to begin with. And, and that's an, an impossibility, right? That to, to have a truly foolproof code? It, yes. There, there's nothing, there's no such thing as 100 percent secure. But um, as a company, we do security um, quality testing for many different software vendors, and we see a vast difference in the, in the number of flaws we find in a piece of software which was developed with a secure development process where security training was given to the developers. They thought about security through the entire phase from design to implementation to test versus software where security is really an afterthought that after the product is shipped, people say, oh, maybe we should think about how to configure it better or, you know, not when, the, when it isn't thought of from the very beginning, there is a big difference in the number of flaws that end up in the end product. Mr. Silva, you mentioned uh, rule number two was for everyone to accept more responsibility. You discussed the importance of education and, and, and things of that nature. But with the prevalence of broadband and always-on technologies, and, and has responsibility shifted somewhat to providers or to cable operators or to telecommunications company, companies whose history and tradition and corporate culture would not ordinarily lead them to believe that protection against hackers or firewalls would be something that would be their responsibility? Well, as I said in my statement, it is a responsibility of everyone, and I think um, we, we, we always sort of gravitate to the um, to the natural thing to do, which is to sort of look at, is this not somebody else? Should, is, is the responsibility shifting from one group to another? I don't think it's shifting. I think it's never changed. I think that, that ISPs, okay, the people that, that we all use to connect to the Internet, have some level of responsibility. Um, I think that the government, uh, that industry, my company, as, as well as all, all of the others, have a responsibility to do their part. For instance, the, the blaster worm has been running around the Internet now for, for weeks, and the, the network providers are carrying the traffic around it. Uh, one would think that they would see that traffic moving around in the network and either, you know, deal with it or, or at least work with a group of people to try to figure out how to mitigate this. Um, but at the same time, if they were to just suddenly start to block that traffic, you know, I can assure you it will create other problems on the Internet. Uh, so I think we, we just have to work together and we have to find out what that magic fingerprint is. There's a lot of these companies that are carrying this traffic aren't in the best of financial shapes right now and are probably not going to invest hundreds of millions of dollars into, into research and mitigation methods. Thank you very much. Is there anything that you have not been asked that you wish to comment on or perhaps respond to as a result of panel one? Is there anything, do you have any additional comments before we seat panel three? Thank you. Thank Thanks. you all very much for your, for your assistance and your input. With that, we will dismiss panel two and seat panel three as quickly as possible. Committee's in recess.
tonight. I note that we have panel three seated. The committee will come back together, and I would ask that you rise, please, and raise your right hand to be sworn in. I swear the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guide. I do. I note for the record that all the witnesses responded in the affirmative. We will move straight to your testimony. I would ask that you follow the example of panels one and two and, maintain, and adhere to our five-minute rule on opening statements. And I will uh, welcome our first witness, George Akers. Mr. Akers is Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for three strategic areas at Cisco, customer advocacy technology, corporate strategic security <coughs> programs, and government solutions. Within customer advocacy technology, he and his team focus on how to most effectively use technology to improve Cisco productivity and strengthen Cisco's relationship with its valued customers. Specific initiatives include technology engineering, autonomic and adaptive networking, cross-customer advocacy research and development functions, and internet capabilities and in integration. He also leads Cisco's corporate strategic security programs with a focus on information security, intellectual property, security solutions, certifications, and cyber warfare. Additionally, Mr. Akers runs a government solutions team to address the unique requirements of government. The mission of this team is to provide solutions aimed at government's core business, enabling achievements of its missions to protect its citizenry. He has dedicated teams to address global defense and space, critical infrastructure protection, U.S. Homeland Security challenges, and a government systems unit whose primary focus will be to adapt Cisco products and services to respond to the unique requirements. Welcome to the subcommittee. We're delighted to have you. You're recognized. Thank you. Chairman Putnam, Ranking Member Clay, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today on this very important issue. Cisco is a provider of networking infrastructure for Internet and intradets of all types. We provide end-to-end -end networking solutions, connecting people to computers and networks all over the world, allowing them to work, play, live, and learn without regards to differences in time, place, or type of computer that they happen to use. Roughly 80% of Cisco's support transactions and 85% of Cisco's sales transactions are completed over our own company website. Therefore, we're very concerned about threats to the correct and the correct operation of the infrastructure of the Internet. Rather than summarize the details already provided in my written testimony, in the short time we have today, I'd like to provide recommendations to three specific groups, industry, individuals, and the government, with specific actions to address some of these threats. Vulnerabilities can never be completely eliminated, as has been previously stated. Establishing a product security response capability is a huge step toward reducing the threat. Another major improvement is gathering by setting up obvious email and easy-to-use web pages by vendors and customers alike so that they're easily accessible, will allow vendors to produce results for incidents that they incur. Most vendors today have neither a team nor notification methods in place. Industry members can contribute greatly by establishing and publicizing product security processes, including taking minimum steps to staff a response team and create necessary links to facilitate incoming reports and outgoing announcements. External reports of vulnerabilities are often accompanied with demands to publish in a short period of time less time than the vendor needs to develop fixed software and workarounds and test these fixes completely. The, publicly, the public is generally unaware of the internal constraints influencing the vendor's schedules. Because every vulnerability and vendor are unique, timelines should be adjusted by the vendor and then the external party for each situation individually. Vendors can help by streamlining their own schedules for producing software and by establishing expectations for negotiating flexible but effective timelines with all external parties. Many individuals and groups fail to practice confidentiality regarding vulnerabilities and fail to maintain computing and networking systems at some moderately reasonable baseline of invulnerability. The consequences can be severe. Individuals should act responsibly regarding vulnerability information, react properly to security advisories, and encourage others to do the same. Some individual practices practice poor control over need-to-know information regarding a vulnerability. Some lack time, timeliness or otherwise detract from the overall success of the process. Numerous plans have been derailed or completely rerouted due to leaks, made more severe by late arrival information or otherwise slowed down by lack or in, of information or improper information. 
Participants are responsible for reporting vulnerabilities promptly and solely to the appropriate recipient, protecting the confidentiality and lending assistance as they are able to. Vendor neutral coordinating centers are valuable conduits for reporting and handling vulnerabilities. The trust placed in such organizations by the worldwide network security community for the criticality of important coordination function might be jeopardized if it becomes too dependent on funding or other centralized government control or any one individual entity within industry or the public sector. Government should ensure that coordinating centers are available, receive adequate funding from multiple sources, and avoid dependencies that will treat any participant unevenly or in any other way unfairly. Many are aware of, of the issue with the script kiddies who find and exploit vulnerabilities but not are aware of the professional black hats who work for the combination of organized crime, terrorists, or nation states. An entire marketplace that exploits vulnerabilities has sprung up on the net and is easy, it has easy to use tools, yet it is virtually unknown to the public. Government should increase funding and support for the development of the maturation of cyber intelligence, the advancement of information sharing, and the overall improvement of law enforcement's ability to prosecute cyber crimes. One issue is common to all the action groups. Vendors respond to customers' demands. Buyers from all these groups wield considerable influence at purchasing time. If product security or response team are important to you, the buyer should vote with the wallet. Specifying systems that meet the demands for more security are inevitably the ways that vendors will respond to include increased security measures in their products. Industry, individual, and government can set effective examples for defining baseline security requirements and require compliance to these simply by, by the completion of sales. The global nature of the Internet means that no single country or industry group can address vulnerabilities in isolation. Success in this arena requires public-private cooperation between all three of these entities. As an example, consider the cooperation industry under the auspices of a National Infrastructure Assurance Council. A working group is developing a vulnerability disclosure framework that should prove to be useful to all parties. The industry leaders I work with understand the roles and are willing to do their part to protect our national and economic security. The recommendations presented here would be a good start, starting point for improving the security posture for the entire Internet. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and the other subcommittee members for inviting me today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Akers. Our next witness is Philip Reitinger. Mr. Reitinger is a senior security strategist with Microsoft Corporation's Trustworthy Computing Security Team. The Trustworthy Computing Initiative at Microsoft is a long-term company-wide initiative to promote the values of reliability, security, privacy, and business integrity. Before joining Microsoft in January of 2003, Mr. Reitinger was the executive director of the Department of Defense's Cyber Crime Center and the deputy chief of the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section of the Criminal Division of the Department of Justice. Mr. Reitinger is the, is the former chair of both the Group of Eight High Tech Crime Subgroup and the National Cyber Crime Training Partnership's Vision and Policy Committee. We look forward to your testimony, Mr. Reitinger. You're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Putnam, Rank Ranking Member Clay. My name is Philip Reitinger, and I am a senior security strategist with Microsoft. I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear here today. Before joining Microsoft, as the chairman noted, I was the deputy chief of the Computer Crime and Intellectual Property Section of the Department of Justice the executive director of the DOD Cybercrime Center and the chair of the G8 subgroup on high-tech crime. Thus, for some time, I have been concerned with criminal threats to people and networks and with the challenges posed by responding to cybercrime. Responding to those challenges requires effective action on many fronts. Today, I would like to make four main points. First, Microsoft is committed to continuing to strengthen our software to make it less vulnerable to attack. Microsoft, under its Trustworthy Computing Initiative, is working to create software for its customers that is secure by design, secure by default, and secure in deployment. We are designing and writing software more securely, making it more secure out of the box, and making it easier to keep secure. These goals are becoming ingrained in our culture and are part of the way we value our work. Even so, there is no such thing as completely secure software. Therefore, and second, when security vulnerabilities are found, processes to provide customers with the necessary fixes must be easy, fast, and transparent so that customers can stay secure in deployment. For example, we have included an automatic update feature in recent Microsoft operating systems. 
My written testimony describes the additional steps we are taking in more detail. Our goal is to make patch application easier so that every single customer can readily have the appropriate patches installed and have his or her information protected. Third, as the recent past so amply demonstrates, criminals will sometimes use computer networks to launch attacks, and we must all be able to respond quickly and effectively. In the case of Blaster, before the worm was released, Microsoft built, tested, and delivered a remedy for the vulnerability which Blaster exploited. We then undertook extensive measures to advise customers of the need to apply the patch immediately and how to protect their systems. After the release of the worm, our efforts continued and expanded and included launching our Protect Your PC campaign, which involved providing security information to users through publications such as the New York Times and the Washington Post. In parallel with these public efforts, we undertook an in-depth review and post-mortem to understand how to reduce the likelihood of similar vulnerabilities occurring in the future. We carried out a full scrub of the subsystem that contained the vulnerability, and today we are releasing an additional patch fixing vulnerabilities we found. We know that security is a process of continual improvement, and we are committed to that process. Fourth, as a society, we need to devote increased resources to law enforcement personnel, training, equipment, and capabilities to prevent and investigate cybercrime. Technical and management solutions cannot prevent every cyber attack. Determined and sophisticated cyber criminals develop new means to break into systems and harm the online public. In this case, Microsoft worked closely with law enforcement authorities' efforts to identify the individuals or organizations involved and created and released Blaster and its variants. But despite the best and laudable efforts of the U.S. and international law enforcement communities, it is still very hard to identify and prosecute cyber criminals worldwide. For example, the computer forensic challenges facing law enforcement are daunting. The amount of data that is stored electronically is growing exponentially, and law enforcement's technical capability to extract critical evidence from this massive electronic data is falling rapidly behind. In conclusion, the blaster worm and its variants were serious criminal attacks against the owners and users of computer networks. These attacks merited and received equally serious attention from Microsoft, the government, our customers, and our partners. In the end, a shared commitment to reducing cybersecurity risks and a coordinated public and private response to cybersecurity threats of all kinds offers the greatest hope for promoting security and fostering the growth of a vibrant, trustworthy online world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next witness is Vincent Galato. Vincent Vinny Galato is the Vice President of Research for AVERT, the Antivirus Emergency Response Team, the Antivirus Research Arm at Network Associates. For roughly half a decade, Mr. Galato has been intimately involved in the day-to-day -day operations of AVERT Labs. Located throughout 18 cities around the world, AVERT Labs is responsible for the research and discovery of computer viruses, including Melissa, Love Letter, and Bubble Boy. Under his leadership, the AVERT group, do y'all name them? Beg your pardon, sir? Are you the ones who name them? We are one of the teams that names them, yes. So Bubble Boy was your idea? Bubble Boy was our idea. <laughs> <laughs> Under his leadership, <laughs> the AVERT group is also credited with the discovery of the first wireless virus, wireless virus phage. Mr. Galato has developed the concepts and initial designs for a number of avert service and solution offerings, including programs such as Web Immune, the world's first internet virus security scanner that resides on the web, as well as the avert malware stinger, a standalone program designed, designed to supplement antivirus programs. Mr. Galato, you're, uh, we're looking forward to your testimony and delighted to have you here. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Chairman Putnam, ranking members, Clay. Thank you very much for inviting me today to join the subcommittee and uh, speak on behalf of a very serious problem that we're having today, uh, computer viruses naturally, and the evolving threat that we see going forward. As you stated, AVERT is an antivirus research arm for Network Associates. We're a global organization working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, discovering new viruses and, yes, naming new viruses as well. In addition to this work, we also work participatingly with 27 other companies in the antivirus discussion network, also known as AVED, and on a day-to-day -day basis work clo closely with law enforcement as often as possible to identify and investigate cyber attacks and cyber crime. 
While my written testimony submitted for the record provides a recent history of computer viruses and worms, as well as descriptions and impacts of the most well-known ones, I want to focus my testimony this morning on three important trends and follow up with three recommendations. First, Mr. Chairman, governments and companies have become more porous. In recent years, companies have opened their enterprises to serve the customers better and improve productivity of employees and suppliers. Enterprises are becoming electronic sponges. They are porous and it's getting hard to tell the inside from the outside. Second, reported vulnerabilities are on the rise, as has been previously stated here today. We've already heard the numbers on the increase and they will continue to increase as time goes on. The bad news is that this new threat, worms, which exploit these vulnerabilities, can cause even greater damage than more traditional worms and viruses. And third, the speed of cyber attacks has accelerated dramatically with a shrinking window of exposure between vulnerability and exploit. Attackers exploit a window of exposure between when the vulnerability is announced and when all the infected systems can be patched. Today the time is short. It's a matter of hours in some cases or a matter of weeks and days. In the future we expect it to become even shorter. Once a vulnerability may be announced, we may see an exploit within a matter of hours and that vulnerability exploited in such a way that within minutes perhaps that exploit will be around the world. Denial of services like Code Red and NIMDA caused spread around the world in hours. And of course, earlier this year, we saw Slammer infect thousands of machines in just under three minutes. So in light of these trends, how do we protect ourselves from computer viruses, worms, and other attacks? One key way is by moving from a traditional re reactive approach to a security approach where proactive intrusion protection is used. What's required to close the window of exposure is protection in depth, including solutions that can be deployed before a new threat appears in the field so that the threat simply bounces off the company's defenses. Intrusion prevention looks for anomalies and attack signatures and responds by preventing the attacks from permeating the network or system defense. An intrusion prevention system protects a network from attack while providing breathing room and response time for analysts to fix vulnerabilities. There are other steps we can take to make a real difference. While my written testimony has recommendations for enterprises and consumers for the sake of time, I would like to share three for policymakers here today. First, we believe policymakers should embrace cyber first responders. We respectfully suggest the cyber security industry, including those at the table here today, represent cyber first responders in our battle against the attacks on the information infrastructure. Policymakers in addressing the threat of viruses, worms, and other attacks should turn to these cyber first responders who can provide policymakers with real time, non hyped, accurate information about the nature of threats and the extent of the impact. Second, policymakers should continue promoting a culture of security, a term used both in the United States and abroad and here today as well. We believe that policymakers around the world can embrace this concept by continuing to shine a light on cybersecurity. Policymakers can support public awareness efforts such as the Stay Safe Online campaign, the government and industry's collaborative bodies, including the Partnership for Critical Infrastructure Security, focused government leadership such as the government's high ranking single point of command that we hope will be announced soon, and real time information sharing organizations, including the various vertical sector information sharing and analysis centers. And finally, policymakers should increase support of long term cybersecurity research and development. In addressing our secure challenges, research and development plays a key role in allowing us to stay ahead of the next generation of attacks. Yet many experts in industry and academia agree that we are at risk of dropping the ball on critical R&D needs. In the area of R&D, we recommend that policymakers authorize a study of our nation's critical infrastructure vulnerabilities, increase R&D funds to leading departments and agencies for collaborative R&D with industry and academia, refocus collaborative R&D on longer term challenges and improve coordination amongst government funded R&D projects. As we commonly know in the industry, security is not a place to get to. It's an ever evolving challenge. We urge the subcommittee in Congress to continue to put energy into addressing the cybersecurity challenge and in return I pledge to you our company's commitment to work with government and industry and academia to develop solutions to these urgent needs. I thank you for having the opportunity to testify this morning and look forward to your questions. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Our next witness is John Schwartz. Mr. Schwartz is President and Chief Operating Officer of Symantec, responsible for Symantec's product development, incident response, sales, support, professional services, marketing and partner relationships. 
Previously, Mr. Schwartz was President and CEO of Reciprocal Inc., which provided comprehensive business-to-business -business secure e-commerce services for digital content distribution over the Internet. Prior to taking the lead role at Reciprocal, Mr. Schwartz spent 25 years at IBM. Most recently, he was General Manager of IBM's Industry Solutions Unit, a worldwide organization focused on building business applications and related services for IBM's large industry customers. He has also held numerous development positions within IBM, including Vice President of Development for the company's Personal Software Products Division, where he was responsible for I IBM's OS2 Warp and PC-DOS product management systems development. As the Vice President of Application Development for Software Solutions Products Group in Toronto, he was responsible for the development and worldwide product management of IBM's application development and distributed database products business. We look forward to your testimony, Mr. Schwartz. Welcome to the committee. Chairman Putnam, Ranking Member Clay, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on this important and timely subject, and thanks for that long personal history. Today, much of our economy depends on critical assets that are in a digital form. We are a society that relies more and more on information technology, yet we have not taken the steps to protect those assets to the same degree that we have our physical assets. The cyber world is a maturing and is a pervasive um, structure in organizations as well as at home. It is also becoming more complex and vulnerable. The attacks are faster, less predictable, and more severe. The number of opportunities for exploitation also uh, continues to grow at a rapid pace. In fact, it is estimated that on average 250 new software vulnerabilities are discovered each month. These vulnerabilities are being exploited faster and more aggressively than ever. Again, on average, the industry is identifying 450 new viruses each month, some with some very colorful names, with many reaching pretty high severity levels. We saw the transition to blended threats with worms like Code Red and NIMDA containing multiple attack mechanisms. These blended threats combined the attributes of a traditional virus, an attack, a hack attack, typically resulting in a massive denial of internet services, and are truly the biggest threat that we face today in the cyber world. Leveraging the vast number of new vulnerabilities and through the introduction of destructive payloads, rapidly propagating blended cyber attacks represent a substantial future risk. The next generation of attacks, of attacks, known as flash threats, have the potential to infect massive portions of corporate networks or the entire internet within minutes or perhaps even seconds. The recent blaster or SQL slammer worms are hints of these types of threats. As you've already heard, SQL slammer infected 90% of the initially vulnerable systems in approximately 10 minutes. Such threats require entirely new proactive systems to stop them as no reactive remedy will ever be fast enough to protect against threats spreading at these speeds. The interconnectivity of individuals, businesses, and government organizations is becoming ever more pervasive and continuous through always-on broadband connections. And as a result, there is a vast, unmanaged computing capacity that is potentially available to the cyber criminals to launch massive denial of service offensives against selected targets or perhaps the internet as a whole. Let me now discuss some actions that we believe can improve our cybersecurity. First, awareness and education, often mentioned today. Educating our consumers, our businesses, the operators of critical infrastructure at all levels of government as well on the importance of protecting our systems is essential. We need a broad awareness campaign that reaches out to all users of the internet. At the least, all users need to be made aware of the value of firewall and automatically updated antivirus technology. I put it akin to seat belts in cars. The remote or wireless connected worker is becoming more prevalent and can unknowingly open up an otherwise secure community network to potential vulnerabilities and attack through unprotected wireless connections in the home or in the office. At the enterprise, at organizational level, the issue of the IT security has for too long been left to the security administrator or the CIO. This needs to change. 
cyber security needs the attention of the top leadership of the business or government organizations. As an example, the recent corporate governance legislation, known as uh, Sarbanes Oxley, significantly strengthened the rules pertaining to the financial management of all businesses. However, the legislation makes no mention of the importance of protecting the information systems that produce the data used in the financial management processes. Only when cybersecurity is treated with the same attention as the protection of physical and financial assets can we enable the necessary cultural change and focus enough attention and resources to truly address the cyber threat. Uh, second, cybercrime. We saw the arrest of Jeffrey Lee Parson for writing a variant of the blaster worm, but we have yet to find the bigger culprits, the original authors of the recent flurry of new attacks. We need to realize that protecting the internet is really a global issue, one that requires better international cooperation. We need more and higher quality resources for law enforcement to work on computer forensics, and we need cooperation from government and industry to assist prosecutors in building cases. We require more harmony in cybercrime laws. Perhaps the Council of Europe's Cybercrime Treaty is a good starting point. The governments and industry should reach cross-borders when appropriate to share information on cybercrime cases, best practices, threats and vulnerabilities in order to gain a measure of prosecution success and early warning of potential attacks. The Industry Information Sharing and Analysis Centers, the ISACs, can be a nucleus of that initiative. There should be a confidential single point of contact in government so that the experts can communicate at a peer level at times of major cyber attacks. And again, the recently announced Cyber Warning Information Network, or CWIN, will be a good base for this exchange. Uh, third, research and development. As mentioned earlier, flash threats may be wreaking havoc in near future, and we must be more proactive in our cybersecurity practices, focusing on behavior blocking technologies, faster threat identification through event correlation, real-time vulnerability scanning, and automated software patch deployment. Given the shrinking time from discovery to exploit, much new research and development needs to take place, which even the combined resources of the industry cannot deliver in time. The government and academia must join this effort with incremental funding, proactive recruiting of the best talent, and highly focused, jointly funded pre-competitive projects. Finally, audit and risk analysis. Security is not a static issue and thus requires regular assessments of systems and vigilance on the part of the IT managers and for that matter all users of the internet. I commend the committee for its efforts to enact programs like FISMA which require annual assessments of government systems and also require actions to improve the protection of those systems. The committee's oversight in this area is invaluable. This is not just something that governments should do but all enterprises, large and small, should be encouraged to follow this example of regular security assessments. Critically, though, we need thorough and timely remediation of any audit findings. The current performance against this criterion of most organizations, governments and industry alike, falls well short of the desired levels. In closing, let me issue this challenge to the industry, government and individual users. We must take cybersecurity more seriously and we must do it together. Aware and compliant users are the best defense against most cyber attacks. Most importantly, we all as individual users of the Internet need to do our part to protect the cyberspace. Experience shows that effective implementations of security solutions cost in the range of 6 to 8 percent of the overall IT budgets. Few corporations or government departments have allocated adequate levels of funding to this critical need. It is time that we put our resources to work to minimize the risk of a serious disruption of our national fiber, uh, cyber infrastructure. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Schwartz. I appreciate the input of this entire panel. And uh, for the record, this was the worst panel about sticking to the timelines. Usually it's the bureaucrats that go over, but this, in this case it was the private sector. But, uh, but, but all of you had very, very interesting, very important uh, information and, and we're delighted to have it. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, with Mr. Reitinger with, with Microsoft. You've, you've had a bad month. Um, it, it, it has, it, it, it's been a, a tough several weeks at the office. Uh, walk us through 
what happens when someone, whether they have altruistic intentions or not so altruistic intentions, notifies you of a vulnerability uh, and, and walk us through the process of developing a patch, releasing it, and, and, and at what point do you notify the federal government as well as your customers? Could you just walk us through that process? Of course, Chairman. Uh, ideally, the process works with, uh, if there's an external notification, uh, someone contacting a software vendor, which might be Microsoft or another vendor, who then begins to develop a patch. Because if the notification is to the vendor rather than publicly, that allows the vendor to work to develop the patch in advance so that the public can be protected. Um, the patch is developed, and that can be a very intensive process. The blaster patch, or the patch for the vulnerability that blaster attacked, uh, for example, uh, was done to a number of different operating systems. The information associated with it had to be developed in, I think in one case, 25 languages, as it said in my written testimony. Um, and then that patch is rolled out. Uh, in the case of Microsoft, Microsoft uh, rolls out patches unless there's a public exploit generally on a Wednesday for, for predictability purposes so customers can know it's coming. Um, at that point, we begin to work actively with, uh, with the community, with our customers, with people in the federal government, including the Department of Homeland Security, to make sure that the information about the patch can get distributed as broadly as possible. Now, this next stage is the most critical stage because patch uptake, as we know, is critical. The vast majority of attacks that we've seen over time have been after a patch is released. So the key is getting patch uptake once the patch is released and available. Um, at some point in that process, as has happened in the case at issue, um, there may be some exploit code that is released. And perhaps eventually there is a worm or other set of attacks that are involved. But that's the big window to get patch uptake as broad and as deep as possible. Does the federal government or, or a particular agency of the federal government receive an early heads up about a vulnerability that, uh, that could have serious consequences? Typically, uh, because Microsoft's products are distributed so broadly, um, both within the United States and around the world, um, the notification is done at the same time. In other words, we, we release to one, we release to all. And the reason is, it, we've got customers around the world. We've got users around the world. Uh, you need to make sure that you can distribute the information as broadly and as deeply as possible. And so, it's generally notification to many. So, you a vulnerability comes to light, you develop the patch, you put it out there, and then it becomes the responsibility of, of the consumer to, to actually patch their system. And, and unfortunately, for, for in, in this most recent case, unfortunately for you, despite the fact that your patch had been out there for weeks, those who failed to, to download it had, had the uh, system go down, and, and so it reflects poorly despite the fact that you had already provided the solution. You are, my understanding is Microsoft's working on some better technology to, to make those downloads automatic. And have, have, are, are there legal issues, uh, specifically the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, that might prevent you from making it easier for consumers to patch their systems? As the chairman's question indicates, there's already a feature in Microsoft operating systems called auto update that can automatically download and prompt the user to install patches. Uh, we are currently looking at how we can make that process easier and transparent for end users so that they can more readily uh, have that option available to them uh, so that more people will in fact use and install auto update. Uh, I think your question about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, Mr. Chairman, goes to the question of whether we could uh, basically say to our customers, you have to use auto update or in, we, you know, install auto update by default. And the answer to that question is yes, there, there are legal problems. Uh, laws like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and um, other regulations, European directives, 
uh, would prohibit access to an end user's computer without or in excess of authority. So we actually need consent to do that, and that's something that we want to do. We want to, in fact, uh, not overcome consumers' consent, but empower them and make their consent more effective, make it them more able to control their own computer security and privacy. Mr. Akers, uh, what, what, what's your take on on the, the whole process of notification and and uh, walk us through your system if it if it differs from Microsoft when you have a vulnerability or a, an issue that may arise that would impact the federal government? Sure, uh, it, it does differ a little bit. Um, we've been at this process uh, since I've been with the company, and most notably our last. Uh, 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 restart of the process was in 1997, so it's a continuous process that we undertake. Um, our intent from the discovery of vulnerability, either internally or externally um, found, is notification to the customer and remediation so that the customer is not impacted. You also have to remember that in the case of Cisco, the fabric of the Internet itself and the Internets that deploy these patches is in and of itself part of the issue we have to consider, our, uh, consider as a part of the problem too. So for instance, we have to be worried about our ability to distribute patches if the fabric itself is not, it does not have integrity. So when we discover a vulnerability, we also begin to develop a patch, but we also at the same time begin to develop a plan of notification and remediation. These take different shapes depending upon the nature of the vulnerability, the technologies that are involved, and the issues that are at hand. In some cases, because we have to ensure that we can deploy the release information and the software itself, we may notify critical infrastructure components of the problem so that they can remediate the problem so we can continue then to work with the rest of the constituent customer base to deploy software release and information. We look at this on an individual case basis and use processes and policies within the company to determine how to do that. At which case we then go through the process of completing the software build much as Microsoft indicated they do. Once all is ready, both the plan and the software, we then begin the notification process and the remediation process with our, with our customers. Um, we believe this process for us has worked well over the years and believe that it provides the best of both worlds in the context of both protecting the infrastructures themselves, our customers, and making sure that we get the information to the hands of the people that can protect themselves before the information is made available to those that might exploit it and use it for detrimental purposes. Do you have a different notification process for an agency of the federal government than you do for an individual customer? We treat the agency or the federal government as if it was a part of the critical infrastructure and we put them into the same structure of prioritization as we would any other critical infrastructure. If we determine that a critical infrastructure asset of the federal government has a particular or unique circumstance, they would be prioritized accordingly within our scheme. Mr. Reitinger, in the cyber hacker world, everybody likes to pick on Microsoft. Uh, it, it is, as we heard in earlier testimony, everybody gets their merit badges by messing with y'all. Are you, you have, a, you have a tremendous background in law enforcement as well, so you've, you've seen both sides of this. Are you satisfied with the, the legal framework that exists today for uh, for punishing people who are hackers? That's a very good question, Mr. Chairman. I think in terms of punishing hackers, uh, the answer is mostly yes, because Congress just last year passed an additional law raising the penalties for cybercrime. And the, how that's going to work in practice, the sentencing guidelines associated with that are now being developed. Um, there are two other areas, though, that require examination. One is, is the, is the breadth of penalties enough? In other words, have we criminalized everything we ought to criminalize as opposed to what the amount of the, the penalty is? And I think that can change over time as you know, we develop, as new ways to harm people online are created, uh, things like identity theft. Um, secondarily, there's the question of 
law enforcement's ability to identify and then prosecute people. And that's the point to which my testimony related. It is actually very hard to, as your questions to Mr. Malcolm on the first panel indicated, it's very hard to identify hackers and virus writers and worm writers online. And we need to do what we can to, to remediate that. Um, and perhaps the, the biggest way to do that is to ensure that law enforcement has the resources necessary to attack the problem, particularly with regard to training and things like forensics capabilities. The last element I just mentioned briefly is the international piece. As Mr. Schwarz indicated, uh, it's critical, well, all, all cybercrime, not all cybercrime, but almost all cybercrime involves an international element. Even if it's a person in the United States attacking a place in the United States, they will probably pass their attacks abroad. So you typically have an international element in cybercrime. That means that you have to have the same capabilities that you have in the United States created around the world. And things like the Council of Europe Cybercrime Convention, um, if ratified by countries like the United States and other signatories, could go a long way towards remediating that problem. Mr. Glotto and Mr. Schwartz, your, your company's mission in life is to protect your clients' systems from these worms, from these viruses, from these hackers, from malicious code. Uh, you monitor this on a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week basis. Do you notice any trends uh, in, in where these threats come from? Is there a seasonality to the trends? Are there more in the summer than there are during the school year? Do they arise from Eastern Europe or Asia or North America? Could you give us some sense of, of, of the landscape of the threat environment? Let me uh, jump in and obviously allow my colleague to uh, comment. We today monitor almost 1,000 customers' networks around the world and have further some 22,000 real-time scanners placed in strategic points around the Internet around the world. Uh, that level of input gives us a pretty good perspective on what's actually happening on the Internet. Uh, first and foremost, the majority of the attacks appear to be originating in the United States. So the, the thought of somehow being flooded from the outside does not seem to hold true. Uh, second, the uh, attacks are um, gaining in, uh, if you will, virility as a result of shared technology, which is very much available in public domains on the Internet. And so one of the comments I'd make relative to the criminalization of this conduct uh, ought to think about including the publishing of exploitation methodologies and tools that can be then downloaded by people who don't necessarily have the skill uh, to further the damage of the Internet. Um, we do not see any seasonality. We do not see any changes in uh, uh, scope um, as the year progresses or as various uh, political events uh, happen to take place around the world. What we do see is a direct correlation between the rise of always-on broadband connection and the penetration of these attacks around the world as these always-on machines are taken over and used as zombies to launch massive, uh, massive further uh, damage. Um, and as uh, my colleague from uh, Microsoft points out, the tracing of these attacks to its origin given today's technology is almost impossible. Mr. Galato. I concur with a great deal of what Mr. Schwartz said. What I'd like to address is a little bit more about the specifics of the, of the origins of the virus writing uh, activity itself, specifically uh, where viruses may or may not come from. In many cases, as we've heard in previous testimony today, and I, and I will um, uh, concur with that as well, it is very difficult for us to specifically state where a virus has been written or where it's originating from. Um, as Mr. Schwartz has pointed out, there is a majority of the traffic originates in the United States, but we're not completely convinced that the traffic that originates in the United States actually came from the United States. I'll go to an example of a group called 29A that exists from what we understand and what we've researched in, um, in Brazil and in Spain. There's a common language between the two. We've seen even in code where one virus writer will acknowledge another virus writer for helping create some piece of code 
together or in such a way in which they were successfully able to take one piece of expertise from one area and the other from another area, get it to work together, and then in many cases, some, uh, it, it will get out. Now, it gets out deliberately in some cases, or they may post it to a website, which allows people to come to that website, get that. They could have come from the United States, double-clicked it when they put it on their desktop, or began to just simply distribute it throughout a network of friends who then may have double-clicked on it to get it moving in the case of a mass mailer. The worms are a little bit more difficult to state, meaning that I may be a virus writer that lives in Belgium, which there is a well-known virus writer. Her name is Gigabyte. She's 18 years old. She may have written a piece of code at her home in Belgium, but she may have taken it to France, went into an internet cafe, put it in her floppy disk, loaded the program, ran it, that program immediately begins to spread. She unplugs the diskette, pays her five euro for the hour that she spent on the, on the computer, and she walks out the door. It begins to spread at that particular point in time. Mr. Schwartz, you mentioned that the majority of the attacks originate in the United States. Do you distinguish between probes and attacks, or, or, or are they the same term? Uh, we do distinguish. Uh, among various categories and severities of attacks. And yes, there are distinctions between probes where people are looking for vulnerabilities or open switches, if you will, open access points, and actual attacks that have been launched to penetrate and, and cause damage. Um, we see about 175 million such events per day uh, across the spectrum of the systems that we do monitor. Uh, categorizing that volume of data uh, to uh, actually identify specific types of attacks is a bit of a daunting task. Uh, what we do uh, with the data is correlate the information from multiple points and attempt to isolate those that have potential for being serious or those that indicate a new type of activity from which we have not been able to defend ourselves previously and then build defenses uh, based on that new intelligence. And do those probes also mostly originate from the United States? Um, the total traffic um, that we see, and again, I uh, agree with uh, Vincent's point relative to the actual pinpointing of the origin of uh, the code, but the total traffic volumes uh, still is uh, to some 75 or 80 percent originating in the United States. What we see is countries that have very large prevalence of always long connections like Korea and Japan ranking very high, perhaps beyond the size of their population. But that may be simply spoofed addresses uh, targeting those countries as a way to launch attacks, but not originating there. One of the concerns that we've heard is particularly with the reference to the, uh, the virus that went silent today, or was, was shut down as of today, is that it is an attempt uh, by these code writers to, to learn, to, to exploit a system for a finite period of time and then before it could necessarily be reacted to, uh, it, 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 it goes down so that uh, they're learning and, and essentially applying that knowledge toward developing the, the better or the perfect virus or the perfect worm. Could you, could you comment on that, uh, anyone? I would agree that's certainly a possibility. We've seen uh, behavior like this for quite some time. Um, approximately three years ago, uh, Mr. Hale, who, testimony, uh, who testified a little bit earlier, and I were on a, uh, a committee, if you will, that looked at a threat called Leaves. It was an internet worm, and at first um, it had looked to be rather uh, a meek worm. But as we did more and more um, analysis of it, it became very complex in what it was that it did. It looked to be something that perhaps someone had created to see what would happen if they released it, what, gather, what data could it gather, where could it go, what could it do, so that they could then in turn go ahead and create another threat of such a nature to then have it go further. Uh, the good news was that person was actually arrested, and so uh, I don't have any idea what happened to that person, but I know that there was an arrest in that case. Now, we could take a look at other such threats and also concur that there is some education process. We could take a look at one specific factor in a threat to say this might be what they're looking to see works or doesn't work. The so big virus now is one that you mentioned is one that is in its 
fifth to sixth generation, meaning it is a multiple family member. There have been other variants of Sobing that have spread quite far as well. And the, the commonality amongst each variant is that it has an extension, which is PIF. And in many cases, when we see a new extension be exploited, it's an opportunity for all virus writers to learn to see if it will become successful or not. Because if it's successful, others will use that same extension, knowing farewell that most computer users, which we would probably look to more towards the, the consumer user, but then again, end users within an environment would not understand. We spent a great deal of time educating people in the past couple of years about how not to double click on anything that has a VBS extension. Well, we got them to understand that those viruses seem to have gone away. However, PIF looks a lot like GIF. GIF is not necessarily a file that can be infected. People double click on it every single day in email, no problems, they get to see something, it's great. It's a misunderstanding. Virus writers probably understand this, use it to educate themselves to see what else they can plant that will become successful. Mr. Schwartz, do you wish to add anything to that? I think this is a, a very accurate description of the actual state of the technology used by the virus writers. Again, I'd like to stress the importance of dealing with the websites that actually publish this information, which uh, are then shared among community of people that perhaps do not have the skill to create the original varieties but can adapt and cause additional damage. One other thought which I'd like to uh, leave with the panel is or with the, uh, uh, the committee is that many of the worms that perhaps or the viruses that are perhaps the most threatening are not those that achieve the notoriety of a so big uh, that are very visible because of the traffic they generate, but perhaps uh, low profile um, type uh, worms or trojans that have been placed in strategic points in the network in uh, systems that are very critical to a business or the national infrastructure that can be triggered somewhere down the road with a subsequent worm, a subsequent attack, uh, causing a disruption of service or causing deletion of data or causing, uh, in fact, just flow of information to an entity that might wish to observe what's going on. So uh, we need to not observe just those attacks that cause the denial of service, very large volume issues, but need to be looking for low profile uh, potentially, in fact, more insidious and dangerous worms than those that we've seen to date. Mr. Akers and Mr. Reitinger, recognizing that there will never be a, a, a perfect code, what can software designers do to develop more secure code, more secure systems, as the uh, abilities of the bad guys, the black hats, continue to improve? What, what efforts can we take to, to get better better, more secure systems? I think there's actually two things that um, uh, we're both doing and we need to continue to do as an industry. Um, education is, is a big part of it with our software developers. We teach our software developers that are coming out of academia today to develop software based on the function required at hand. And we don't teach them to be mindful of the issues around security that might provide vulnerabilities and subsequent exploits. Um, there are a number of programs out there. Uh, there are centers of excellence that are a part of a program at the National Security Agency. There are a number of other venues by which we acquire information about how to do good quality, secure software engineering. And we need to continue to educate our software engineers in academia how to do those things. And for those that are out in practice today, we continue to do what we're doing, which is bringing that information directly to them so that as they develop the product initially, they're mindful of the issues that we're dealing with from a security standpoint uh, today. This is something that's going to be an on ongoing process. The second thing is uh, continued testing. And that is something I know that, that most of the vendors uh, here and, and, and most of the vendors across the community are, are doing more today of than we ever have. Uh, we internally have programs. We externally have programs. And we are going to continue to reinforce our ability to simply look for and test for those vulnerabilities that we might be in a position uh, to, to uncover that we can then mitigate prior to the time of, of an exploit. Uh, I want to kind of piggyback on the last question a little bit too. Uh, as as uh, we look at this issue around vulnerability yielding a, an exploit, um, the other thing we could do is we could watch the testing 
of some of this exploit code. I can't think of a vulnerability that's been disclosed that at some point along the line somebody didn't turn the knob to see if it was more interesting than maybe the vulnerability seemed at the time the vendor talked about it. And if we start seeing these kinds of things, government, private sector should be able to identify those instances and come together to take a look at what the miscreants might actually be doing and then start thinking about how to thwart the attempts that they may make at those particular vulnerabilities going forward. You mentioned the education and, and then and its importance uh, for your software designers, but these miscreants, as you referred to them, are script kiddies that, that are earlier were, Earlier there was this sort of bifurcation of, of the younger, uh, more intellectually driven. It's a game. Some people do crosswords. Some people try to break into systems. Uh, and then the more malicious types. Now, don't script kiddies grow up to work for the Microsofts and the Cisco's of the world? Uh, not knowingly in my case. <laughs> we, I mean, we, take, we take a very dim view of that activity. Um, but no, typically, um, it's difficult to even distinguish between the activities of the script kiddies and the more orchestrated and well-organized, funded, and otherwise uh, uh, notable uh, engagements. As a matter of fact, understand that it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility that those more well-developed uh, organizations and entities could take advantage of the behavior of the script kiddies to accomplish what they want to accomplish. Um, so. Uh, education of software engineers is a key part of it and what you generally find or at least what we generally find is uh, they do have a, 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 a once educated they do maintain and, and 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 have a clear understanding of the issues and want to do the right thing I think as was said earlier it's almost viewed as being patriotic to make sure that when we're providing critical infrastructures we're doing with the highest degree of quality and security that we possibly can and our developers take that to heart much like the rest of the developers in the community do. Mr. Reitinger. Mr. Chairman, let me answer that question in two parts. The first, what software companies can do, and then turn to the education point. Uh, what software companies can do is have a robust software assurance process, uh, conduct code reviews before software ships, use independent test teams, do threat modeling, make sure they train their developers, uh, use automated tools to test for security. Uh, and seek third-party certification, such as the common criteria. This is something that companies like Microsoft and other software companies do. Uh, they need to conduct robust after-actions when vulnerabilities do occur to figure out what went wrong and how the process can be fixed going forward, because security is really a destination as opposed to uh, an end, or excuse me, is really a process as opposed to an end. Software companies need to make s security easier to do so that the software is secure out of the box and it's easier to maintain going forward. So there's a whole software assurance and software support process that can ease the burden and, make th and help solve the problem. With regard to education, uh, there are a number of components of that. One is educating users about how they can secure their systems. That's the focus of a lot of government efforts in the Microsoft Protect Your PC initiative. Uh, there's also the component of the ethical outreach to kids, which was the subject of your present colloquy. How do we stop, how do we, how do we make young folks, if you will, uh, not do the sorts of things that some of them are doing now, um, attacking systems, so that we've got less chafe that we have to worry about to find the wheat. That's a really hard problem uh, and I think requires us to figure out how to convince young computer literate people that breaking into systems, if you'll pardon the colloquialism, isn't cool. Um, it doesn't build your status in a peer group. It's like burning down a building and people really get hurt. Um, that's something we, we have not all successfully done yet and we need to continue to work on. Mr. Schwartz, Mr. Galata, do you all have any comments on either of those issues? To do you have any comments on uh, the education component, how we can be more effective at it, whose responsibility it is? Let me offer one suggestion. Obviously, education is hugely important, and the more we do, the better for all of us. But there, are, there is a technology solution that can be applied to partly address this problem, which is something that we call client compliance. 
or compliancy as it is called in bad English. Um, client compliance is about ensuring that when a client is reaching out to the network to be connected, that the network has the ability to test whether that client meets some basic minimum standards of good housekeeping relative to security. Uh, it would be great if we could come together, government industry, and develop a joint standard for how that compliance could be achieved, and then have the ability for the ISPs or the in-house servers to, in fact, test every client before they are given access to the network. That technology, in addition to education, could help us dramatically improve the level of standard, the level of security uh, that we see today. Mr. Glado, any comments? With regard to the education aspect, today we, we face a, a point where we're about to probably look at the next generation of threats and how is it that we can educate primarily the home user to protect themselves from those threats. We have got them to the point where they understand that they uh, are probably best served by putting antivirus on their machine and then updating that antivirus as often as a vendor uh, makes it available. Antivirus today is, is no longer sufficient enough to protect everyone from the threats that we are seeing, uh, such as the Internet worms, uh, which uh, in many cases travel at certain points in the Internet where there may not be an antivirus product that can actually support or protect them from that. Therefore, as we've sp spoken about today, the evolution of the threat, uh, we have to evolve our education and how we go about having the, the consumer at home understand that the Internet is a big city. And like many cities, there are good parts and there are bad parts. You should proceed in, with caution in both areas and understand that what you may find in the good part is good. What you may find in the bad part might look good, but it's not necessarily good. People that are using the Internet today to exploit children, they're looking to exploit consumers by stealing data to, for a financial gain, I think are, are slightly different than perhaps some of the script kiddies that we've spoken about today. Um, but clearly, when we developed uh, the Stay Safe Online campaign some time back, I think we looked to find that to be an avenue in which we could teach the consumer ways in which we could uh, have them understand as to what a bad guy looked like on the Internet and what a good guy looked on the Internet, and perhaps what a bad guy that looked like a good guy on the Internet was. Uh, I think funding plays a huge part in it, naturally, to be able to maintain and, and uh, sustain this type of education, this evolving education that we need, which is why many of us today have talked about ways in which we can find funding to further R&D, but that R&D will include education. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm told that there's a 1.30 hearing in this same room, and so we need to bring it in for a landing. Is there anything that we have not covered that any of the panelists would like to add to the discussion uh, before we wrap up? Beginning with Mr. Akers, do you have any final comments? Mr. Reitinger. Thank you for your, the opportunity to testify today, Mr. Chairman. Delighted to have you. Thank you. Appreciate your insight. Mr. Galato. No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Dr. Schwartz. Well, thank you all very much. This has been an outstanding hearing. I do apologize for its length, but I think that it was valuable and, and well worth our time. I will remind everyone we have two more hearings next week uh, on cybersecurity as well. And uh, with that, the um, record will remain open uh, for two weeks for submitted questions and answers of topics that we were unable to get to today. The subcommittee stands adjourned.
This morning on Washington Journal, a look at Homeland Security and the anniversary of the September 11th attacks. We'll talk with two members of Congress, Georgia Senator Saxby Chambliss and Florida Congressman Elsie Hastings.